Hello you lovely cubs, it's the Dragon Lord here back again with another movie of a what if. Once again, what if Tanjiro went back in time the movie, the entire series in one place, nine parts combined in one. Who would have thought we'd ever get there? Anyway, if you are new around here, like and subscribe if you haven't already. Let's get to 10k before the end of the year, and yeah. Like and subscribe, already said that, but I'll say it again. Join the Discord and our Roblox group, both links in the description. And if you haven't already, go check out my friends, especially Spencer. Their links will also be in the description. With that out of the way, let's get into it. Tanjiro sat there, collapsed. The other slayers all exhausted. Many casualties, many deaths. Lots of pain and suffering going around, but at the same time, this cozy air, this feeling of happiness, this unrelenting satisfaction. They had beaten Muzan Kibutsuji minutes before, and now they were just treating the wounded. This was... Their goal, this was the Demon Slayer Corpse's goal, they had finally beaten Muzan, the progenitor of all demons, the biggest threat to humankind other than natural disasters, but yet they could be seen as a natural disaster as well. It was peace for the first time in hundreds of years for them. It felt kind of addictive in a sense, yet something was off. Their savior, the one who held out the longest and probably contributed at the most to the fight against Muzan Kibutsuji, Tantro Kamado, was passed out. He sat there, head down on his knees, but something was wrong. He was regenerating rapidly at a point where it wasn't even human anymore. People looked on and they all knew what was going on, but they couldn't get themselves to accept it. Tanjiro was a sun breath user, which meant that if he ever turned evil, he could be the destruction of mankind. But what was happening right now was that very simple thought, that very simple Bad omen. Tanjiro was becoming a demon. Very quickly, many Hashra that were still sort of okay jumped up, as well as Zenitsu and some of the other slayers. All jumping at Tanjiro, wanting to stop him and suppress him so that he couldn't kill anybody. And then they'd have to see to maybe get some more medicine or have to just kill him there on the spot. Make sure he doesn't kill anybody that he goes out like a human. It was pointless though. Tantro, in a swipe, killed some weaker slayers. Giyu was upset. Tantro couldn't hold himself back like his sister yet. What was happening? Tantro was crying. It's as if he was in immense pain. What, what was going on? Giyu was confused, but he couldn't let up. He grabbed his sword once more as he started fighting this demon Tanjiro, who seemed to be immune to the sun already. He fought and fought, but Tanjiro was just that much stronger than him, and he was already exhausted from fighting Muzan. How was he supposed to fight a demon that is supposedly even stronger than Muzan himself? Currently, Tanjiro wasn't sane. Everybody could see that. This was their only shot. 
if Tandro became sane and maybe got corrupted by Muzan's evil, then it was all over. More and more slayers. Lower ranked, but yet still strong, able to easily take care of lower moons themselves, rushed at Tantro, yet they all got killed in an instant. More and more. Death. So much more death. They had already suffered enough from Muzan. At that moment, a cry was heard. It was Nezuko. She cried out to her brother, yelling that he should just stop and go home with them. Tandro flinched for a second, but his rampage continued on right after that. Gyu and the others knew that they'd have to reach Tandro's mental state. If they could wake him up, maybe he'd stop the killing until he was cured. Or maybe he'd become Nezuko, where he wouldn't kill anybody. Yet, he kept going. He kept killing, no matter how much they shouted. They tried fighting him, but his strength was so far ahead of them. It was terrifying. At one point, Giyu got a pin on Tanjiro. He decided that he'd just decapitate Tanjiro right then and there. Maybe he hadn't become fully Demon King yet, and maybe he could still be killed by decapitation. So he tried. Decapitating Tanjiro. Tanjiro's eyes changed. His head was now rolling on the ground, but his eyes were no longer pure white. They were his normal pupils, yet there was one big difference. They had a sort of slit in them, like a snake or a cat would have. It was the exact same as Muzan. Tanjiro looked at his fellow comrades and cried. His tears had stopped a while ago, but now they were flowing so greatly. He disintegrated right then and there, as if he gave up the will to live. Nezuko tried to grab hold of her brother, but it was too late. He had turned to dust. She cried. She couldn't take it. It was too much. Most of the slayers there burst out into tears. They all knew Tanjiro. He was kind to everyone. He always helped out and always had a smile on his face. He only really ever got angry when it was about human lives. Mainly when demons toyed with humans. They all recalled a piece of it and all broke down in tears. It didn't matter that he killed so many people, well, it still mattered, but to them it was painful in so many different ways. Their friend who got forced to betray them, they had to take care of him, and then in the end he still gave up his own life just so that he wouldn't rampage anymore. His kindness, which was so infinite... It just all swelled up, and they all cried. Even Ubiashiki's son, who didn't know Tanjiro as well as maybe Ubiashiki or the other Hashira, still wept it here. He couldn't help it. It was as if something had forced him to. Tanjiro was seen as a hero by most of the Slayers. Not only did he save a lot of lives... He also killed Muzan, or well, held out the longest against Muzan. And in the end, he got robbed of his humanity. It felt wrong. Giyu yelled out, angered. At God, Buddha, why would it always take the good people from him? He didn't understand it, but, well, that was that. Tantra himself didn't know what was happening. He was rather floating in an infinite void. He didn't feel pain, and he felt a bit weird. Yet, he had a few regrets. He wished that 
he could have been there with everyone after their victory and shared a meal. He wished that less people would have died and less of the Hashra. He wept as he thought back to Kyojuro, Gyome, Shinobu, Obanai, Mitsuri. He felt sad. He turned around to see a big light. And next moment he woke up. It was a familiar scene, forestry, kind of cold a bit. And it was a man dancing. What was this place, he thought to himself. In a second his mind snapped. This was home. And was that his father? He was back. But how? He saw his father dancing in the snow, never stopping to take a breath once, just dancing constantly. He recognized this dance, obviously, it was the Hinokami Kagura, the dance that he had then refined back into sun breathing and perfected through the memories of his ancestor. He looked around to see a smaller child next to him, Nezuko. He thought, wait a minute. He looked at his own hands. He was back to being four years old. He looked up behind him and there was his mother, smiling, standing over them, watching them. Tanjiro got up, his small four-year-old body, feeling a bit strange. It hurt a bit. He couldn't understand why, but... His body hurt. Instantly he realized he was using sun breathing. He had done it so much in his past life, using total concentration breathing. And now it just felt normal. It was as if it was something he had always done. He walked up to his father and started dancing alongside him. Perfectly copying the moves. In fact, Tanjiro's dance looked even better than his father's. His father didn't stop dancing to praise Tanjiro or anything, he kept going, with Tanjiro dancing alongside him, but his mother stood there, confused. Did Tanjiro have a massive dancing talent, was her thought, but no. This was something different. She couldn't under she couldn't explain it, but well, that was about that. Tanjiro danced along his father the entire night, even when his mother tried to get him inside to sleep or to sleep. He didn't. He danced the entire night together with his father. Next day, after Tantra had slept a bit because he was just so exhausted, his father talked to him. He asked him how he copied the dance and the breathing technique, and Tantra didn't have an answer. He just simply said that his father taught him. Tanjiro was a bit confused. He never taught Tanjiro how to do it. But... Maybe just observing him taught him how to do it. It made him smile a bit because Tanjiro was just such a bright child, as he patted his forehead, caressing it softly. Tanjiro thought about everything. Was this a second chance he had been given? He didn't quite understand, but he asked his father if he could go on an excursion. His father questioned what he meant, and Tanjiro said he just wanted to go somewhere, for a few days. So his father asked where. As Tanjiro pinpointed the location, Tanjiro said it would be too far for him to go alone. If it was maybe the village down below the mountain, he'd let him go if he went together, but this was too far. But Tanjiro really, really wanted to go. He didn't want to just sit back, and Tanjiro didn't understand it, so he talked to Kie about it, and a few weeks passed, and well, at the end of it, Kie thought maybe Tanjiro just wants to explore the world a bit. 
as it was quite a few villages away, and they'd see quite a lot of the world, so Kie told Tanjiro to go with him. Like sort of father-son bonding moment. Tanjiro thought about it and knew that the journey would take about a week, considering that Tanjiro was still a child and they couldn't walk at a faster pace. Yet, he decided it would be alright, and that if Tanjiro got tired, he'd just carry him on his back. So they set out. It was a bit strange that a four-year-old boy already wanted to explore the world, but Tanjiro thought it was fine, and it would teach Tanjiro anyway. Yet, Tanjiro had other plans. He wanted to do something different. They walked. And Tanjiro surprisingly kept up with his father just fine. For a four-year-old. Tanjiro was also more mature than he was a few weeks back, Tanjiro marked. But this was simply because Tanjiro had memories of, well, his life. Everything that happened. He was maturing. And he had already physically grown stronger simply because he started using breathing at such a young age, which only had been done by one person so far. Naturally, of course, which was more than 400 years ago. Yet, now Tanjiro was also gaining that strength at such a young age, and he seemed to be fine. In fact, he felt stronger. Now, Tanjiro did know that this was a multiple-day trip, and this would take at least three days now, because Tanjiro was keeping up with him, so he decided that they would stop at a nearby inn. It was an inn situated on a little hill, but there wasn't any other building in the vicinity. There was a lot of forestry nearby, and he just knew that this inn was not so popular. They didn't have a lot of customers, but they did serve people pretty well. So he went there, carrying Tanjiro on his back, yet Tanjiro smelled something. It was the smell of blood. He got concerned as he jumped off of his father's back. His father worried that Tanjiro might have hurt himself on landing, yet he started running instead. Tanjiro quickly followed behind his son, easily keeping up, as he himself was physically stronger than most people, and, well, he wasn't plagued by his disease yet. He looked around, but didn't see why Tanjiro was running. Maybe Tanjiro got scared of something and started running. Was that the reason? No, that was not the reason. Tanjiro opened the door to the inn that they had arrived at. Tanjiro, who was a bit behind, thought to himself, Oh, he was just excited to get to the inn, I guess. Yet, when he opened his eyes again, he saw something. A fact about Tanjiro is that he could see through people. He had this transparent world, and he knew that Tanjiro was getting physically stronger and that he was using the breathing technique even better than he himself was using it. He had actually learned a lot from Tanjiro. Whilst it did not look like it, he was observing Tanjiro when they did the Hinokami Kagura dance, and he had seen that Tanjiro had subconsciously fixed mistakes that he had made in the dance. Now, obviously, he didn't have the perfected dance as passing it down would only degrade the dance, but it seemed that Tanjiro had a natural talent for these things. He also fixed up his breathing technique because he saw that his was incomplete compared to Tanjiro's, and he felt better after using this new breathing technique. It's as if his wasn't pure. Yet he was looking at this being. He didn't quite understand, as this was just simply not human. This weird being had a muscle mass which was not similar to humans, and it was staring at Tanshiro pretty weirdly. When taking a better look and getting closer, he saw that there were a lot of dead people around this being, as the being jumped up at Tanshiro, yet Tanshiro seemed to dodge. Was this a weird humanoid monster or something. He ran inside seeing this weird green-skinned thing with big teeth, canines sharper than any blade, claws that were just 
devastating, and it was leaping at his son. He got angered and grabbed his hatchet, which he had always with him. Slashed at the being, cutting off its arm pretty easily, grabbing Tanjiro and jumping back, jumping through the door of the inn, getting back outside. Tanpa remembered that this seemed pretty familiar to the time that he first saw a demon eating on someone at the temple, right before he met Sekonji Rokodaki. The demon walked outside, regenerating its arm. Tanjiro screamed out to his father that that demon couldn't be killed by any ordinary blade, but that they should try decapitating it and waiting for sunrise. Tanjiro didn't quite understand Tanjiro. He knew that this thing wasn't human. Calling it a demon, though? What a weird thing to say. It's as if Tanjiro believed the stories his grandmother had been feeding him. Maybe Tanjiro should give her a stern talking to, but, well, it didn't quite matter. Tanjiro started doing the Hinokami Kagura dance, which his father found strange. His father looked again, and the hatchet he was holding was gone, but he knew that he had a pretty firm grip on it, so why did he let go? Tanjiro was holding it now, and Tanjiro got scared that his son might hurt himself. Yet Tanjiro rushed forward. This looked like the Hinokami Kagura dance, but it was no longer a dance. It was as if it was being used for the purpose of harming someone. Tanjiro rushed forward, and the demon's head came clean off. What had his son been doing? What did he just do? This thing wasn't human and was definitely a lot stronger than humans, yet Tanjiro just seemed to decapitate it so easily. He was only four years old, but he had gotten quite strong. Tanjiro thought that his level of strength could be compared to that of a teenager, but he was wrong. Tanjiro using breathing could easily be the same strength as an adult grown man. He just hadn't seen it right away. The demon grabbed its head, and Tanjiro got a bit disgusted as it just stood back up and reattached his head. Tanjiro was exhausted and fell to his knees. He threw the axe to his father as his father caught it. Tanjiro said that he couldn't fight much longer, but his father understood, and he saw what Tanjiro did. His father started fighting the demon. The exact same movements Tanjiro made. He had realized that, that the Hinokami Kagura was not just a dance, it was a sort of fighting style for weaponry. He tried to decipher the moves into sword dances or fighting techniques, and Tanjiro was watching, a bit impressed by his father's pure talent, because he was actually getting the moves pretty right. Tanjiro needed a lot of experience to do this. He had learned a breathing style, he needed to see other people's movements, and he needed just to experience and experiment, yet his father was pretty much just learning it on the spot, and he was doing it pretty well too. The demon had stood no chance, yet, well, his father was also getting exhausted. Tanjiro knew that his father could probably not fight much longer. At that moment, someone appeared. It was a normal demon slayer, yet his rank was not shown. He had a sword and sliced at the demon, the demon trying to run away. And then he decapitated the demon as the demon started disintegrating. Tanjiro pointed his axe at the man, saying that if he dares harm somebody around him, that he will fight him. He was a bit scared because, well, this man had just taken care of the demon as if it was nothing. Kind of like how his son did. Tanjiro said that I was fine, and that this was a person of the Demon Slayer Corps who helps kill demons. The man nodded. Surprised that a child knew this as they were a pretty secretive organization, but maybe they had already seen Demon Slayers before. He introduces himself as Shinjiro Rengoku. 
Now, Tondro hadn't quite instantly recognized him, but now that he got a better look, and while well, the moon came from behind the clouds, he saw that this was indeed the Flame Hashira, Kyojuro Rengoku's father, who was currently the Flame Hashira. Tanjiro unconsciously smiled. This was his second chance, but he didn't really give it a good thought until now, but he could save so many lives. He could get stronger than what he was before, and when they fought Muzan again, he could beat him without much trouble. This was his thought, at the least. He now, after all, had another 12 years until that moment would come, and, well, he just could get stronger anyway, so it didn't matter. The Demon Slayer, Shinjiro Rengoku, who was also a Hashira, introduced himself to Tanjiro's father and said that he was quite amazing of a fighter and that he's quite strong and that he should join the Demon Slayer Corps if he could. Yet Tanjiro just looks at his son saying that his son was the one who intercepted first and that his skill is far above his own. Tanjiro is a bit confused about why his father would say this, but then he realized that he subconsciously, or didn't even try, but he sort of released all of his strength on the demon right away. He had been killing demons for many years now, and, well, it was something different, but he was quite strong. Tanjiro, however, when looking at his son, got worried as he ran up to Tanjiro. Tanjiro's mark came back. It wasn't quite a complete mark, and he had to look through the window of the inn, but it was the mark he had gotten after final selection. It came back. The Demon Slayer mark. It had partially awakened in him once again, but yeah, what was this? He was confused. Shinjiro looked at them both, a bit jealous. Tanjiro caught up on this and asked him what was wrong, as he then explained that both of them, Tanjiro and Tanjiro, could be sun breath users. For the fact of their hair color, their red eyes, and well, the mark on their forehead. He calls them gifted people, saying that people in the history of the Demon Slayer Corps who had marks, red hair, and red eyes were always super gifted, that they were always stronger than others. He says this, but then he just says that he will bury the bodies of the people inside, as he ignores the questions that Tanjiro poses. He buries the bodies, tells them to stay safe, and leaves. Tanjiro didn't quite understand the hostility, but he was worried. He said that they would return back home, but Tanjiro protested, saying that they should continue on on their journey. At that moment, Tanjiro asks who Tanjiro is, because he doesn't seem like his son. He's still happy, and he's very bright, but he knows a bit too much, is what Tanjiro thought. Tanjiro explains. He starts talking, and he says that he has these memories, almost, of the future. He explains that things will go very badly if they don't go to the location that he said to go. Tanjiro decides to just follow along. They continue on their journey. Because while he does prioritize his family, it could maybe be a good idea to at least see what Tanjiro is so worried about. They continue walking and, well, after a day and a half of talking, with Tanjiro asking many questions about Tanjiro's techniques and that dance that he changed into a sword technique, he figures out that Tanjiro turned the Hinokami Kagura in a sort of offensive technique, which hurts him, but when Tanjiro explains that it was intentionally designed as that, he questions it. Why was this technique being passed down? Because they were charcoal burners, but why would they praise the fire god? He didn't quite understand it, but he would figure the answers out eventually, with Tanjiro probably telling him. 
He knew that if Tantro truly had memories of the future, then he should probably listen a bit more to his son from now on. They arrived. They arrived at this big mansion, and Tanjiro thought for a second that they were in the wrong place. Maybe Tanjiro meant that they had to go around the mansion and continue on their journey. Yet, no, that wasn't the case. Tanjiro knocked on the doors of this mansion. An attendant opened up and asked what their business was at this estate. Not naming a name, which was pretty uncommon, usually there was always a name given. Tanjiro looked up at the maid and just said that he would like to talk to the person who owns the mansion. He gives a pretty sincere look, a look that the maid had only gotten from some other people, Hashira. She closed the door once more, and Tanjiro and Tanjiro waited outside. Thirty minutes passed, and Tanjiro said that they maybe should just go. But Tanjiro knew better. A while ago, a few crows had landed on the front of the gate. And they were looking down on Tanjiro and Tanjiro, and one crow had left after a bit. Tanjiro knew these were the Kasugai crow that the demon slayers had been using to communicate with each other, and he knew that he should just wait and see. The gates opened up after another ten minutes. Tanjiro a bit confused, but Tanjiro just standing there. There was an older person, but he seemed to be ill with something. He had a mark on his forehead, but it was different from Tanjiro's and his own mark, that they had received that birth and that Tanjiro had received rarely all of a sudden. It was purple like a disease, and it was slowly spreading. Tanjiro could tell, using the see-through world on this man, he could tell that his body was going through a weird shift. Meanwhile, Tanjiro looked straight at the man, and then down. The man spoke, yet a calm tone, yet it wasn't like the Ubiyashiki that Tanjiro knew in the future. No, that couldn't be possible because that Ubiyashiki was only 11 years old now. At least Tanjiro had thought about that. This was his father. And although he had a calm tone, he was a lot louder in his words, as if he was more bold and more strict. He asked them what, he, what they were doing there and what their business was with them, but... Tanjiro just looked at him and spoke. I would like to join the Demon Slayer Corps, he said with a serious tone. The man laughed, saying that children make the funniest jokes these days, but his father wasn't laughing. Tanjiro was angered, confused. But most of all, he just kept asking why. Why would Tanjiro put his life in danger? He knew that his son was strong, but he didn't want to see his son suffer. And he knew that demon that they faced wasn't as strong as most of the demons that they probably faced, because why would there be a need of such a strong person like Shinjiro Rengoku when facing these demons? He didn't quite understand it. Yet, someone spoke. It was a softer voice, way softer. But it was this young boy, about 11 years old, Tanjiro thought. Kagaya Ubiyashiki. The man Tanjiro had fought for in the past came to them. He saw Tanjiro, and he saw that Tanjiro had a spirit behind him, a sort of strong presence. He asked his father if they could test him, but his father said no, saying that they should leave as he closed the gate, saying that children don't belong here. However, Tanjiro also asked if he could join the Demon Slayer Corps, and if it pays well.
Tanjiro was a bit confused, but he understood why his father would ask that. After all, he had a family to take care of. The man once again laughed, saying that their cause is much more righteous, but yet if the performance was well, they would obviously give money. Tanjiro said that he would love to fight for humanity as he saw the horrors that these demons committed, but that he needed to be sure he could protect his family or at least provide for them at the same time. He also didn't want to be far away from them. Yet the man laughed, saying that the only people that get that kind of privilege are the Hashira. At that moment, someone appears. He's a bit agitated that that their meeting got interrupted. Shinjiro Rengoku. He gets surprised, saying that he saw these people before. The Ubiyashigi leader, the father of Kagaya, coughs a bit and then looks at Shinjiro, asks what he means, and when Shinjiro explains that they fought a demon, both of them holding their own pretty well, he laughs once more, saying that Shinjiro shouldn't join on these people's jokes. Yet he asks if they can do a quick spar with one of their subordinates. A lower-ranked Mizunoto Slayer shows up. Tanjiro gets given a sparring sword, a wooden sword, but it's still fine. And he gets told to fight this Slayer. He, t he makes quick work of him, actually, because, well, he had been talking to Tanjiro about the Hinokami Kagura, and he saw how it could be used in battle, and Tanjiro also told him a lot of the movements that you should make. It wasn't as perfect as Tanjiro's was when he fought Muzan, but it was damn well good. It was enough for Tanjiro to say that he could effectively use this in combat. Shinjiro got a bit confused, but thought that this might be the sun breathing because, well, Tanjiro just had taken care of a slayer easily, and he was not trained in their books, so, well, that was that. The Ubiyashiki leader of the Demon Slayer Corps laughed, saying that he underestimated Tanjiro because of his skeletal frame. Tanjiro said it was nothing, and that he doesn't know if he wants to do this, but that he simply wants to support his son. The Ubiyashiki clan leader laughs, looking at Tanjiro. However, Tanjiro has already grabbed the wooden sparring sword. The Mizunoto slayer that fought his father was unconscious, and he wasn't going to wake up anytime soon. Kageya Ubiyashiki, the future leader of the Demon Slayer Corps, also was a sort of pseudo-leader of the Demon Slayer Corps. He was only 11 years old at this time, but... But his speaking skills were great, and he could convince a lot of people. A lot of people already saw him as the new Demon Slayer Corps leader, as his father's mental health or physical health was getting a lot worse. But his mental health was also fading. Kaguya had said something. His father told him to speak up and to be more assertive. As he spoke, he said, let's bring that new Slayer in. It was somebody that they had scouted a while ago, not too many weeks ago, but he was supposed to be a criminal to be executed, as he apparently killed people, but of course the Demon Slayer Corps knew better. His father said that it could be a pretty good test, as they had seen that the Slayer had a lot of potential, and that pretty soon he would already be a Hashira. Kagaya spoke. Gyome. Come. Gyome came out from behind the Hashra. He was guarding one of the gates to the mansion. He walked up and bowed, asking how he could be of use. They told him to grab sparring weapons and to get into a spar with this young man. Gyome looked over and he felt a sort of energy. He had always had a sort of pseudo-transparent world, and his senses were already great. It was Tanjiro. He asked why he had to fight a grown man. 
which Kaguya was a bit confused about, not understanding what he meant. As he spoke, he explained to Kiyome that Tanjiro was only four years old, which Kiyome said that he had remarkable fighting energy for somebody very young, which Kaguya didn't understand, but Kiyome just got his wooden weapons. He got into a stance, and Tanjiro was not happy about this. His son was about to fight someone, and he didn't want him to get hurt. He was only four years old, but yet he showed remarkable talent. That's the only reason he would let this pass. Tanjiro, however, got into a stance, surprising most of the slayers around them, because this looked similar to a water-breathing stance, yet not completely. It was a stance Tanjiro had used often, because it was a stance he had made himself. It allowed him to either instantly start using water breathing, or instantly start using sun breathing. It was the transition he had made later on, which allowed him to go into the defensive forms of water breathing, or the offensive forms of sun breathing. He waited for Gyome to attack. He was excited because... He knew Gyome, and he respected Gyome a lot, but now he could fight with a younger Gyome and see how much Gyome had grown in the years of him being a Hashira. Gyome started the fight. The Hashira were already impressed with his talent, because they knew that if he became a Hashira, he could bloom even more, and that in maybe three or four years, he'd be the strongest. They already knew this. Yet, Tanjiro was keeping up relatively easily. Gyome hadn't reached his peak strength, and in terms of sh raw strength, Tanjiro was currently beating him. Not because he was physically stronger, but simply skill. It was all just skill. Gyome started fighting harder, and then he started fighting seriously. But Tanjiro started fighting seriously back, clashing with Gyome over and over, deflecting his blows and attacking his weak spots. Eventually, Gyome fell on his butt. It was the first time he had. Their fight lasted for almost two hours, and everybody who was watching couldn't keep their eyes off of it. Tanjiro was keeping up with somebody who was 10 years older than him, and already was being trained as a demon slayer. Now, this was impressive to them because he had no background as a slayer. They asked him if he would join the demon slayer corps, and Tanjiro said that it's too early for him to join. He spoke as he said that he will keep bettering his skills, and if his father also ends up joining, He'll train together with his father, but that maybe right now it's too early. He says he'll be back when he's around seven, maybe eight years old, which is maybe a time when he'll be physically more adept. The Hashira are a bit confused, but, well, they leave it be, saying that Tantra should just move on, go back home, and enjoy time with his family. Now, the leader of the Demon Slayer Corps is not happy because Tanjiro and Tanjiro are showing remarkable talent and they want to grow it. Yet, Tanjiro says that they're also just a family that got wrapped up in this. Which Tanjiro questions because before, a few days ago, they had never even heard of demons. Tanjiro and Tanjiro walked away. They got escorted out of the mansion as they started walking down the path to go back home. Tanjiro and Tanjiro talk, and Tanjiro asks Tanjiro what happened. Tanjiro explains that in the future, his father would die of a disease. He cried as he spoke. He was young mentally, even though he had all his memories, he was still a child, and his emotions were showing quite hard. He said his father died and passed away, and that he started taking care of the family, but that then, one day when he wasn't home, the entire family except for Nezuko got slaughtered. As Nezuko got turned into a demon, 
and he explains all of the events that happened. The entire time that they're walking home, he explains every single detail. Everything that he, in quote, remembered of his future life. Tanjiro doesn't question it. He now knows that this is all true. As he says that this time it won't happen. That this time they'll be stronger. They arrive home after a few days where they have a heartfelt meal as a family. Tanjiro and Tanjiro start training, but Tanjiro also works with Tanjiro a lot. They are cutting down trees and doing charcoal burning way earlier, but they're making sure not to breathe in any of the air. Or the smoke, as it could be bad for them. Tanjiro feels closer to his father than when he was nine, because now he understands that his father doesn't have no emotions, as most people would say. He's just not able to show them that well because of the transparent world and the selfless state. But they are there, and now he can feel them. Tanjiro also feels close to Tanjiro because, well, Tan Tanjiro showed him something and told him about the things he had learned. He sees Tanjiro as an older person, maybe double his age already. He doesn't quite understand it, but he leaves it at that. They cut down trees, sell the charcoal, train, and that is about it. A few more children get born, as Kie gets a few more children, and Tanjiro's father is actually in better health than he was in the past, which makes Tanjiro think that maybe his disease was caused by the smoke of the charcoal. He explains his thinking to his father, and maybe his father might just have an idea. Tanjiro was getting older. A few years had passed, in fact three, since the time when he and his father had went to the Demon Slayer Corps. They had gotten quite close as they shared a lot of similarities. Tanjiro had also changed his mark. His mark now resembled Tanjiro's, just a bit more roundish, not as spiky. It was the after effect of training with Tanjiro. It was something weird because, well, he didn't really know what it was. He felt stronger, and even though he had been shown to have an illness a while ago, now it didn't feel like that. In fact, he felt better, stronger. He didn't feel as frail or weak as before. Not that he was, because, well, he could fight a bear easily. He was quite strong, but he looked frail, and he knew that as well. They had taken a few precautions. Tanjiro had listened well to his son. He had thought of all the possibilities of why he got ill in the first place. After all, Tanjiro had told him everything that would happen in the future to the minute details. It was something unforgettable. He knew that his son wasn't lying because, well, he would know. After all, he could see the boy's heart. He knew if his heart accelerated that he would have been telling lies. He was pretty keen on knowing if people lied or not. Then again, it didn't matter. Being prepared would just always be better. He had seen the horrors called demons himself, and he didn't want to see his family die in such a sad way. He trained with Tanjiro for all three years, since the time that they got back. They stopped trying to breathe in the air from the charcoal they were burning, and they just took steps at a time. Tantro would teach his father the Hinokami Kagura, or, well, sun breathing, the refined version, and he himself would train as well, trying to get a stronger physical body. Tanjiro had actually learned total concentration breathing in this time because Tanjiro had taught him. He had been doing it subconsciously this entire time because it was already ingrained into his soul but well his father he didn't quite know it yet so he helped his father achieve it which his father did and well his father got stronger from that as well 
They would train together, spar together, go cut down trees together, go down to the village together. They would do so many activities together. That doesn't mean that he would give less attention to his other children like Nezuko. It just meant that he had spent more time with them in general because he included them in their trainings as a way of them seeing the Hinokami Kagura more than only in Christmas time. They didn't all quite know it yet. Tanjiro was still thinking of the right time to tell his wife and his kids about when they'd have to go. After all, him and Tanjiro were planning their plans, their ideas. They would leave around when Tanjiro was eight years old. He'd have to at least train a year or two under a slayer because, well, he was still a kid. And he had to be at least ten years old if he wanted to partake in the Demon Slayer exam. At least that's what Tanjiro thought of as an adequate age. He himself would instantly go take the exam and try and join the Demon Slayer Corps. He would then move closer to Mount Sagiri, because that mountain had a slayer on it, and he'd be at least somewhat relieved as his family lived there. Now, he himself didn't slack off on his training. In fact, he had to catch up to his son, because Tanjiro each day was growing stronger and stronger. Around when Tantra was six, he spoke something. He said something about him being near what he was in his final fight. Now, his father was confused. Finals fight? He hadn't told him everything that was going to happen in the future. So, what was he talking about? He didn't question it because his son looked a bit sad about the matter. But Tantra knew himself. What he really was talking about was that he himself had grown closer to what he was right before their storm on the Infinity Castle, right before all the Slayers attacked Muzan together. He was around that strength when he was six years old, getting even closer when he was seven, the only limitation now being age and his own body having to grow. He was quite strong and his muscles had developed greatly, but now it was just a matter of age, and also a matter of skill, though his skills were almost perfect. If his body was stronger, he could definitely move like how he did when he fought Muzan, but that seemed to be the only problem. His proficiency was already at the best it could be for his current specifications or hardware, one could say. He didn't let it get him down, he tried to find out other things, he remembered some of the techniques the other Hashura had, and he tried to imitate them, tried to learn them. He was not really one who could do that right away, but, well, he had all the time he needed now, and pretty soon he could learn under Okodaki again. He could ask him things that have been on his mind for so long, things that Rokodaki might have an answer to. After all, Rokodaki was one of the best Hashura in the past, so... Maybe if he could get some pointers from him, it would be great. Well, Tanjiro left it at that. His mark had also changed. It was almost the exact same as it was when he fought Muzan. His transparent world was now fully under his control, and it didn't drain him as bad as it used to. In fact, he could almost use it constantly without it feeling any different. It was as if... It was natural to him now. He felt stronger, stronger than he did in his past, even though he wasn't. It's just like his senses had become a lot better than what they were in the past. It made him think because, well, his father explained to him that he had been breathing in a certain way since he was a baby. So, did he come back all the way? That was his thought. He might have just been born and then subconsciously been using that breathing technique. That meant that since his birth he had been training. Which was fine, but at the same time, did that mean that he was now like that one man from 400-something years ago? Was he like him? There was an uncanny resemblance, because, well, he remembered everything from the past, but... Well, that didn't matter too much now. At age seven, Tanjiro made his plans with his father. He would go to Sokonji Rokodaki on Mount Sigiri and train there for two years. 
Meanwhile, his father would go and take final selection, which Tanjiro was fine with. After all, his father was at least equal to him when he was fighting upper moons. Maybe not as refined, but that would come with time and a lot of training. His father, after all, had more than only training on his mind. He had a family to take care of. And Tanjiro, as well, had to do that too. It was now both their duties. They continued doing their work and their training and everything they were up to, and thus a year quickly passed, as if it was nothing. Kie and the others got informed that they were going to move. Now Kie was a bit disturbed because this had been a family home. Now Tanjiro reassured her that this would still be their home, but that they would be moving for a few years because of a new job opportunity that he had been given. He didn't quite want to tell them everything yet, he would only do that once he was actually part of the Demon Slayer core, because then they couldn't protest anymore. Kie was fine with it, and Nezuko and the others were excited because they would go and explore the world. Meanwhile, Tanjiro said he'd be also going to a mountain nearby because there was a teacher there that was going to teach him some arts or something. Kie didn't get all the information, but... She saw that Tanjiro said that it was fine, so she let Tanjiro go. They moved out, and thus Tanjiro shortly after arrived at Mount Sagiri. His father telling him his goodbyes as he stayed at a house together with the rest of the family. It was a bit bigger than most houses, and it had actually been supplied to them by the Demon Slayer Corps, because, well, Tanjiro had let them know he was going to take final selection, but that he wanted to move his family closer to a Demon Slayer, so that they could be protected whilst he was not there. Currently, the Demon Slayers were under supervision of a new young lord, or young master in a sense, Ubiyashiki. Kagaya Ubiyashiki, the young boy who had met with Tanjiro and his father long ago, those four years. The sight of Tanjiro and his father beating demon slayers that were trained, both of them not having any background, was quite strongly vested in his mind. He remembered that Tanjiro had taken somebody down who was now a Hashra, and who had been a Hashra for four years. Right after Tanjiro had beaten Gyomei, he had learned a lot. It's as if he learned everything from Tanjiro. He got a lot stronger, and in only a week after that, he became a Hashra, bettering himself every single day, gaining immense strength, surpassing all the other Hashras in only a year. He was now the strongest Hashra, but that didn't matter. He tried to better the Demon Slayers, and it was as if that was something Tanjiro ingrained in his mind. When Buyashiki had heard that Tanjiro's father would be moving closer to Mount Sagiri, where the former water pillar was going to be, Sakonjiro Godaki, he wondered... Was Tanjiro going to learn under him? Was Tanjiro going to learn water breathing, even though he had already shown to have a breathing style which might even be superior to that? He sent out a crow which would take two days to arrive, but he wanted to know for certain. He sent it to Mount Sagiri. The day before he had sent out the crow was the day that Tanjiro had gone up to Mount Sagiri and knocked on the door. There a boy opened the door. It was a boy with black hair, blue eyes. Giyu. A 13-year-old Giyu. Tanjiro bowed and said his hellos. Giyu didn't quite know who Tanjiro was and just said hi back, as then another boy came to the door. Sabito. Tanjiro remembered Sabito as, well, Sabito had trained him. Long ago. It brought a tear to his eye as he thought back of the memories. Sabito yelled out as he said, Sensei, turning around. There, Sekonji Rokodaki walked up to Tanjiro, looking at the boy, examining him a bit. 
and he asked him what he did there. Tanjiro looked at him with a firm expression and asked if he could train under Sekonji. Now, Sekonji didn't like taking anybody just willy-nilly, but he felt this strong pressure from Tanjiro. He said that he'd have to give him a test first, but he asked where his parents were. Tanjiro spoke that they lived down the mountain, a bit away, but it was only like a 10-minute run and a 40-minute walk, which Sekonji questioned how fast Tanjiro could run if it only took him 10 minutes to run from there to here. Tanjiro continued, he said that his father would take final selection soon, and that he himself will take it when he's 10 years old, but that he wants to learn a few things from Sekonji to better himself. Sekonji laughs a bit. It's a light chuckle, but it's just... He's questioning why this boy is saying that he just wants to learn a few things to better himself. Wouldn't he want to learn water breathing from scratch? He asks that question, why the boy would want to only learn a few things and not the entire water breathing style, and Tanjiro then speaks that he already knows it which Sekonji is confused about. Currently, he should be one of the only water-breathing teachers. Maybe there was one other, but he couldn't quite think of who. After all, he had taught many, but none were at the level where they could teach somebody else. Sabito laughed as he got close to Tanjiro, saying that he's too cocky, and that if he wants to receive Furukodaki sensei's teachings, that he should bow down and beg for it, which Tanjiro got a bit confused about. Was Sabito always like this? He seemed a bit more jokish, more childish, not as serious as when he trained with him. Giyu laughed. It was... A sight that Tanjiro only remembered right before they went into the Infinity Castle, when he had told him that it was okay, that it was okay to live for the sake of Sabito and Makomo. A girl spoke. She came from behind Sabito, as she said that Sabito should not judge a book by its cover so quickly, and as Tanjiro might be stronger than him. Sabito scoffed. He challenged Tanjiro to a duel right then and there, throwing him a wooden sparring sword. Sukunji stopped him, saying that this was no way to treat somebody who wanted to learn, but he let go, which surprised Sabito because he hadn't focused on Tanjiro for a while, he was currently fully focused on Sukunji, but Sukunji was looking at Tanjiro. Tanjiro is currently emitting an intense battle pressure. His smell had completely changed. It was the smell of a dangerous animal. That's what Sukunji was currently smelling. Meanwhile, Tanjiro had taken a battle stance. As he spoke, I'm ready, let's go. Sabito grabbed his sparring sword and proceeded to use the first form of water breathing to rush at Tanjiro. However, his attack got deflected as he got kicked in the stomach and sent back, flying straight into the side of Sekonji's house. Does that prove that I just want to learn a few things and not the entirety of water breathing? Sekonji nodded as he said that he would try and answer any of the questions he had. After all, he saw that Tanjiro had remarkable talent and that he perfectly used water breathing. It reminded him a bit of himself, which was a bit confusing, but he let it be. He spoke with Tanjiro as they all sat around a table and ate. Tanjiro got invited for dinner as he got also invited to stay there for the coming two months. Tanjiro asked why, but Sekonji told him that with his skills he could probably easily pass final selection. Tanjiro said it was alright and that he would think about it. The next day, Tanjiro asked a few questions. They were mainly questions about little things, little slips in the body that he had only noticed after he had checked himself out. He had used the transparent world 
whilst looking in a mirror and performed the Hinokami Kagura and water breathing to see the faults in his own body. He asked about minimal movements and Sekonji tried to think up answers, but even he didn't have quite all the answers because, well, he couldn't use the transparent world. It was only then that he realized that Tandro was a marked slayer and that he as well had the transparent world, which were only things that they had documented in the Demon Slayer's history. He told Tanjiro that he couldn't quite answer everything, although he tried to answer a few things about forms, like water-breathing forms, stances, and that it should be free-flowing, not as constricting as Tanjiro had been telling him his movements had felt. It didn't quite help Tanjiro a lot, but it gave him a few ideas, he'd just have to experiment with it himself. Meanwhile, Sabito, Giyu, and Makomo were also paying attention because Tanjiro had obviously mastered water breathing. If they could learn from him more, then final selection would be a breeze. And thus, Sabito walked up to Tanjiro. He bowed and apologized for his rudeness as he asked him if he could spar with him for the coming two months and if they could train together because he would like to beat final selection whilst being at his strongest. Giyu became a bit more serious as well. He realized that even though Sabito was miles ahead of him, even he was no match for this eight-year-old boy. They had to get stronger because if there's someone who can beat Sabito, that means that there's probably a demon that could beat them too. So he wanted to get stronger, though he was still a bit childish and he liked to make jokes, but he had to fight for his sister's sake. Makomo joined in because, well, Sabito had joined in, and she just joined in because, well, why not? The four of them proceeded to train and spar together, because why not? It just seemed like a good way to grow, and Rokodaki was fine with it. After all, all of them had cut their boulders, and currently the only thing that was waiting for them was final selection, which was in another two months, so he let them be. A few days passed, and the crow that Ubiashiki had sent out had finally re reached Sekonji Rokodaki. It was a crow stating the events that had happened four years ago at the Demon Slayer HQ, the events revolving around Tanjiro Kamado. They talked about how strong the boy was at four years old, and how he beat somebody who became a Hashra a week later. And who, that Hashra now speaks very well of him. Stuff like that. It didn't stop there, it continued saying stuff about having to try and get Tanjiro to join the Demon Slayer Corps, and that Tanjiro would get the full benefits and support of the Demon Slayer HQ, but there was a challenge. Sekonji spoke the words of the letter loudly as he was standing in front of his students and Tanjiro. He told Tanjiro the final message of the letter, which was a challenge. The challenge stated that if Tanjiro beat Final Selection, next Final Selection, he would not only be allowed to join the Demon Slayers, but he would also be allowed to rank up instantly to the rank of Kinoe, the rank right before becoming a Hashiro. It was something of a special privilege. The others couldn't quite believe it as they were more known about the Demon Slaying Slayer's corpse rules, but Tancho didn't really care as long as he could just save people and undo the things that happened in the past and end Kibutsuji Muzan's life. That was his only goal. Though Sukonji continued, there's a few other benefits in here, like you get to go to the swordsmith village and make a sword there. Now, Tanjiro was a bit confused, but Sukunji spoke and gave him his thoughts on it. 
He said that in the swordsmith there were a lot of higher quality ores than there would be at final selection. Usually these would be given to Hashra if their original one broke. But this meant that Tanjra's sword would be made by a master, or at least someone with a lot of talent. Which Tanjra looked forward to. He was a bit saddened that his sword would this time not be made by Haganezuka, but it didn't matter. It was going to be a good sword either way. Furthermore, Orokodaki spoke. His salary would be doubled compared to what a normal Kinoe would be, and there would be other benefits as well, like he would be allowed to attend Hashra meetings and other stuff like that, which Tanjiro looked forward to. After all, he wanted to see some of the familiar faces from the past. There were a few other benefits, but... Tanjiro didn't really care about them, they seemed more minor than what, well, it just didn't matter to him, that was all that it was that. His training continued, with the other three. Two months quickly passed, and well, it was time for final selection. There Tanjiro saw his father. He walked up to his father and tapped him. His father looked down and wondered why Tanjiro was there. Wasn't he going to take final selection when he was ten? But Tanjiro explained that things changed, and that he had to take final selection now. Tanjiro was fine with it, as he looked at his son. He noticed something different about him. He wasn't quite much stronger than before, but it was as if he was happier. He looked behind Tanjiro and saw three other kids. They were around the age of 13 and 12, but they didn't seem that much stronger, besides for the fact that their muscle mass was unordinary and they were using breathing as well. But everybody around here was, so it wasn't that much of a difference. Tanjiro explained that they were the people from the instructor that they were near, and that he had been training with them for the last two months. They had all gotten significantly stronger from training with Tanjiro, as he was quite a valuable sparring partner. Two little girls appeared. They started explaining the rules of final selection, and told them that they had to reach the top of the mountain in seven days. Which the others thought about, but it was pretty normal procedure. They all went into the mountain, and Tanjiro and Tanjiro split up. They both split up to go fight demons on their own and to help people out. Meanwhile, Sabitomakomu and Ngiyu stuck together. They got into their fights, but Tanjiro took care of most of the demons with relative ease. There wasn't really anybody there that could fight him, after all he was at least on the level of upper moons now. His father as well had a relatively easy time, he had just need to get adjusted to... killing, is what he thought. Because it was hard for him to take life though he would pray for every demon that he killed. Sabitoma Komo and Giyu also had a relatively easy time. They were helping out other slayers, which was what Tanjiro and Tanjiro were also doing. A loud bang could be heard. There, a demon stood, grotesque, massive, mutated in figure. It stood before Sabito and Makomo, Giyu was a bit behind because he had injured his leg. The demon laughed as it pointed at Sabito's mask. It began gloating about the fact that it had killed all the people that came in with a mask because they were all Sukunji's students. This made Sabito mad, but he regained his composure. He knew that fighting someone on emotions was bad, that he had to stay calm. The demon attacked them. Makoma was about to get hit, but Sabito pushed her out of the way, blocking the blow. He rushed at the demon afterwards, but he got hit. It wasn't that grave as he tried to dodge, but 
he still got grazed by the attack, which hurt him quite bad. The demon started laughing as it moved from Sabito to Makomo. It wanted to get her first. However, in that moment, another boy appeared, and in a flash decapitated the demon. It was Giyu, who had attacked the demon by surprise, cutting, cutting its neck. It was difficult to cut, but he still did it. The demon was mad as it tried to attack, but it disintegrated slowly. Giyu panted very heavily. He looked back at his friends, and Sabito looked at him, confused. He had gotten so strong all of a sudden. He hadn't realized it, but out of everyone, Giyu had put the most effort in the last two months. He saw his own weakness and wanted to get stronger. He still was nowhere as, nowhere as strong as he could have been, but that didn't matter. He'd get there, and then he'd show Sabito that he is somebody who can stand by his side. He sat down as his leg was starting to hurt again. Makomo treated Sabito and then went over to Giyu to treat him again. Sabito thanked Giyu, their bond getting closer as he now saw Giyu as his actual brother. But Giyu already saw Sabito as his brother, which was really sweet. Meanwhile, Tanjiro was cleaning up demons as if it was nothing. He was saving slayer after slayer, though he didn't know if they would survive afterwards. And soon seven days had passed, just like this. They had gotten to the top of the mountain. There, Sabito Makomo, Giyu, Tanjiro Tanjiro, and five other slayers had made it out. This was quite special because there were so many slayers that had survived. Tanjiro was a bit sad because there were still slayers that had died or who had left final selection because they were too scared. It was inevitable, he thought. There he got approached by the little girls. They spoke to him. They measured him at the same time and then told him that he'd have to go to the Demon ha Slayer HQ. He asked how he'd got there and then he remembered the Kasugai Crow. A very young crow would land on his shoulder. It had a bit of a speech problem, but Tanjo understood it. The Grow spoke and said that it would guide him to the Demon Slayer HQ, which Tanjiro was fine with. All the other Slayers there also got their uniforms, their crows, and they got to choose their medals. Tanjiro's father looked at Tanjiro as he questioned which one he should take, and Tanjiro just told him to stick with his gut. Tanjiro focused, closing his eyes for a second and then opening them again. He looked at all the oars. And in the end, he chose one out that he felt a sort of connection with. He gave that ore to one of the girls, and she thanked him for taking part in the final selection, because she knows that he's Tanjiro's father, and that he's probably very strong as well. So she's happy that he joined the Demon Slayers. Tanjiro questions why Tanjiro is not choosing an oar, but then he sees that Tanjiro also receives a tattoo. They all receive a tattoo. He's a bit skeptical at first, but after they tell him that it has no repercussions on their health, he's fine with it. It displays instantly that Tanjiro's rank has gone up to Kinoe, the highest rank possible. Tanjiro questions why his son is given this rank, and they explain to him that he's been given a challenge by the new master of the Demon Slayers, which Tanjiro accepted, and he completed the challenge, which was to beat Final Selection. He'd have to go to the Swordsmith Village now, and after that he'd have to go partake in a Hashra meeting, which was set in another three or four weeks. That's what his crow told him. He was fine with this. After all, it just meant more adventure. But now the hardest part came. Telling his mother. Tanjiro, Tanjiro, 
Sabito, Giyu, and Makomo had all passed final selection. They now had to go back home. Mainly, Tanjiro's father had to wait two weeks before his sword would be made, and Tanjiro had to go back home to tell his mother about what he had done. Tanjiro's father had already told her that he would take part in a exam and that he would be gone for a few weeks, but Tanjiro had never explained why he was gone. He had explained why he had gone to Rokodaki and why he had stayed there because he wanted to train, but he had never told his mother that he wanted to become a slayer like his father. So now came the time that they had to go tell her together, which his father wasn't really looking out for because he didn't want to get yelled at. But they made their way back. They stopped by Rokodaki's mountain first as they dropped off Giyu, Sabito, and Makomo. They said their goodbyes to Rokodaki. Rokodaki also said his goodbyes to Tanjiro and also greeted Tanjiro's father, saying it was nice to meet him. Tanjiro's father said likewise as they continued on. They had to go home after all. Their children were waiting. Well, Tanjiro's father's children and his siblings were waiting. He was a bit scared because he'd be gone from his family for a long time. Yes, they'd be safe under the Demon Slayer core, but he was still scared nonetheless. They made their way over, eventually finding the house. It was bigger than their last house and looked more modern compared to their last house, more like a city house, more like it was in Tokyo. It wasn't something that Tanjo could get used to, but, well, he'd just have to do it anyway. They made their way over, and they got inside and got greeted by Kie and Nezuko, a young Nezuko. She hugged her brother, after all, she hadn't seen him in a few weeks, and she had really missed him. Kie also hugged her husband and son, asking where they had gone. Tanjiro would start to explain with a calm expression on his face, as he started explaining that they had both taken the test that he had said. Nakie thought that the test was something related to Tanjiro's job, but he came clean. He told her about the Demon Slayer core and about what they did and how dangerous it was. She was scared and then mad because he had dragged her, their son into the entire ordeal. But Tanjiro spoke up. He said that he chose to go on his own volition, and that he didn't get hurt, and that he was actually in better condition than his father, which he laughed about. Kie nonetheless scolded the two of them, and warned them that if they kept doing such rash decisions that they wouldn't get any food. However, she didn't reject the idea of them working together. For some strange reason... She had always believed their grandmother's stories or her mother's stories about demons, and she had never liked a thought of people losing families to these demons. Considering how strong Tanjiro and his father are, them helping out might make a bit of a difference. So she let it be, though she told them to be careful nonetheless. Nezuko questioned whether or not her brother would be gone a lot. Tanjiro said that he'd be back as often as he could be, but that for a long periods of time he might not be here, depending on what missions he might get. Tanjiro and Tanjiro both looked at each other, knowing that they'd have to spend some time away from their family. Though Tanjiro knew that with all the people they'd be meeting in the future, he wouldn't have to worry about his family's safety, and they would surely not be bored without them. Tanjiro's younger brothers and younger sister came up to him as well, hugging him. They asked him where he was for so long, and, well, he explained it a bit, but then dinner time was practically there. So they all sat around the dinner table and ate food. Tanjiro didn't know why, but he started crying. It was faint, but only a few tears fell, but few people had noticed it. He wiped his tears quickly because, well, he didn't want to worry his family. He had gotten back the memories of his past life. This time, at least, he could protect them all. 
This time he could be there for them. He continued on speaking because he was explaining stories to his younger brothers. They were excited, vouching that they would both also become demon slayers, yet Tanjiro told them that they wouldn't have to because he would finish the job. Tanjiro speaking like this sent a bit of a shiver down the, his brother's spines, but, well, he had a noble goal, so to speak, so it was fine. They ate in peace together, and quickly time passed. Three days. Tanjiro had to move out now. He had to go to the swordsmith village where he would get his sword crafted for him. Meanwhile, looking back, he saw that his family was worried, but he told them that he would be okay. After all, he was allowed to borrow Rokodaki's training sword for the time being. He left. Moving out, he ran after the crow, keeping up with it. It guided him until a certain point. There, a Kakuchi had stopped and looked at him. Tanjiro was still eight years old, but he definitely had the rank of Kinoe tattooed on his hand. He showed it to the Kakushi. They knew that a Kinoe ranked slayer would go by and that they had to guide him to the swordsmith village. So, Tanjiro's crow departed as Tanjiro got guided towards the swordsmith village, blindfolded the entire way. However, it didn't have much effect on him as he had. They continued on their way, and Tanjiro got passed from Kakushi to Kakushi until he eventually arrived at the swordsmith village, where he got greeted by a few of the smiths. They were excited to see someone with so much talent arriving there. However, Tanjiro just asked a question right away. He asks if he can spar with the Yoruichi Type Zero doll that's here. The swordsmiths ask him how he knows about the doll, and he says that he just does. It's like a feeling, a presence. They think about it and they say that it might be a good way to see Tanjiro's skill and see who should make his sword. After all, they hadn't assigned him a blacksmith yet, and depending on his skill, they might need a greater blacksmith like the village chief, for example. They bring him to the Hiroichi Type Zero. Now Tanjiro pulls out his sparring sword, or his training sword that he had gotten from Moroko Daki. They set the doll on a pretty big mode, as Tanjiro is somebody who has fought against a Hashira, after all, so they think that he needs the strongest mode of the Yoruichi doll. Tanjiro goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the doll, and keeps up pretty well with it. He recognizes the movements in the doll, which he couldn't really recognize before, which were the movements that they tried to imitate, his movements. Tanjiro fought back, and well... It was pretty easy deflecting the blows, as he knew where the doll was going to hit, and he had already experienced it way before. He beat the doll. Furthermore, the doll started making creaking noises, as some of its hands started to fall off. A man got pretty angry, and his hands were a child, a three-year-old boy. He got so angry at the doll's breaking because it was something he had been protecting from his ancestors, as it had been passed down from generation to generation. Tanjiro apologized, but said that there was something inside the doll that he would like to retake for himself, which made these swordsmiths question what he meant. He said that there was a sword inside of the doll, which led to the others saying that he's crazy. However, the chief of the village didn't say that he's crazy. In fact, he ordered for the doll to be put back up and to fight Tanjiro until it broke down, which made the older man angry as it had been in his family for a few generations. Well, a lot of generations, but the chief basically said that it was already broken and that they might as well see if Tanjiro is lying or not. The man sets the doll back up as it starts fighting Tantro again. However, Tan now Tantro has an even easier time because the doll's pretty much half broken. He sees, though, that he can still learn. Considering that the doll has more arms, he can learn how to fight demons who have more arms, which he struggled a bit in his last life. Not a lot, but 
He thought back of a few memories of him be fighting multiple enemies as well, back when he fought the Swamp Demon. He shouldn't have struggled as much as he did, and this was still a learning opportunity, even though he had already fought it. He decided to go a bit more serious, as he defeated the doll, pretty easily. It broke down and out came a sword. It didn't have a handle, and it was just the blade part of the weapon, but it was definitely a sword. Every smith there saw the quality of the blade that the iron was made of, and Tanjiro asked if they could turn this sword back into a usable weapon for him. They asked him why he would do that and not something personalized, and Tanjiro says that this blade is as close as they'll get to something personal for him. They question why though, because once a slayer uses a sword, that sword is tethered to him, not to somebody else. And Tanjiro explains that this sword is a perfect match to him. An almost perfect match? It's almost impossible, but... The swordsmith, village chief, he sees it. He knew that Tanjiro felt a connection to the Yoroichi Type Zero doll, and that it must be because of the sword. He orders for a few smiths to take it away, as he'll personally work on it. Tanjiro gets invited to stay for, well, however long the village chief needs to finish the sword. And Tanjiro accepts. He ends up staying there and, well, he can just relax. He keeps training though, and even though he broke the Yoroichi Type Zero doll, he's a bit sorry and he basically starts helping the recruits that used it for training by training them. They fight him, even though he's way harder than the Yoroichi Type Zero doll, they obviously see this as a more rich learning experience. Other than that, he just enjoys the Swordsmith Village. He liked it a lot in the past, and he even likes it a lot now. He ends up going to the Hot Springs, where he stays for a bit. As he enjoys the... Calmness. There, he is greeted by a... Voice. A voice he hadn't heard before, but it was very soothing, calming. It reminded him a bit of his mother. He looked around and there he saw a girl who had black hair that was pretty long and beautiful pale purple eyes. She looked a bit older than Tanjiro, maybe 13. Now he thought that this was Shinobu, but that couldn't be. Shinobu would be 10 years old around now. And also this person, even though she had a resemblance to Shinobu, was still different. She joined Tanjiro in the hot spring. She was wearing a bathing suit, so he didn't mind at all, and he didn't have any weird thoughts. She was excited but scared, her tone. She shivered as she spoke, and, well, she gave off a very stressed-out scent. Tanjiro asks if she's alright. She spoke, saying she had just become a Hashira, and that she was a bit scared because in a few weeks there would be a Hashira meeting. She didn't know exactly when because the crow hadn't given her an exact date, and she was scared that it was maybe because of her. She was scared that she didn't perform up to standard. Tanjiro could see she was holding up pretty well, like she was shouldering a big burden. She had a calm exterior, but he could tell that inside she was a bit distressed. He had remembered that he was like this in the past too that he was afraid of his own strength and that he was too weak to keep up with the people. He took in a deep breath, which got her attention. He looked at her in the eye and he basically reassured her, saying that becoming a Hashra is not an easy feat, and that she should be proud of herself because of how strong she is. The girl took a minute to think about it. She got a smile on her face, and Tanjiro could tell that she wasn't as stressed anymore, that she was relatively calm now. She excitedly clenched her fist. You're right, she would say, as she thanked him. She quickly introduced herself right after as Kanae Kocho. Tanjiro, for a second, had 
a look of surprise on his face. He introduced himself as Tantro Kamado. Kanae asked him why he looked so surprised though, because, well, maybe he had heard something bad about her. She asked him if they had already had a Hashira meeting without her, talking about if she should be a Hashira. As she started talking a bit faster and a bit more open-minded, Tanjiro was a bit confused and couldn't really keep up well, but he asked her why he thought that he was a Hashira. On second thought, she looked at him again and asked him how old he was, because even though he was quite tall because of his increased muscle mass, he still had characteristics of a kid. Tanjiro said that he was only eight years old, which Kanae wondered why he gave off such an intimidating pressure. Tanjiro explained that he had finished the final selection about a week ago, or a bit over a week ago, and, well, she asked him what a rookie was doing here. Usually, some slayers would be trained here, but only usually slayers that were already under the care of Ahashura. And there would definitely not be a slayer who has finished final selection here if there weren't a Hashra or, well, at least if they weren't stationed here. So she asked him if he was stationed here. And Tanjiro said no. He explained how he was currently waiting for his sword to be created. And she asks him if he has already even gone on a mission since it has only been about a week and a half since he had finished final selection, but Tanjiro explains to her that he doesn't even have a sword yet, so how would he have to go and finish final selection? She thinks for a second and then basically apologizes for not thinking it through and making such a dumb remark, yet Tanjiro says that it's fine. He explains how his rank is already at Kinoe, and that he basically already beat a Hashira once, or well, a soon-to-be Hashira once which was pretty impressive because he did that when he was four years old. After he finishes explaining everything and the entire circumstances that led him here, she wonders who he is because, well, at four years old, beating a Hashira, someone who should be equal in strength to at least Kanae, would be pretty impressive. At least she thought about it like that. She wasn't boastful, but she at least knew her own strength. Tanjiro explained that he just wants to help people out, and that he doesn't want people to die to demons. Kanae is saddened by this because she remembers her parents, who had died protecting her and her younger sister. She started speaking about her family as well, about the attack that happened on, well what had transpired, and Tanjiro explained that he was very sorry that something like that happened to them. Kanai explained as well that her younger sister is also currently part of the Demon Slayer Corps, however she's not as strong as Kanawe herself. Kanai continues talking as she asks Tanjiro if he actually beat a Hashira, or well a soon-to-be Hashira. He explains that when he was four years old, he and his dad had gone to the Demon Slayer Corps to talk, or well, to at least um, ask something and to demonstrate their power, because they had both been pretty strong. And at the time, he had fought somebody called Gyome Himejima, who turned into a Hashira a month after he had left that place. And he explains how he beat uh, that person. Kana is pretty impressed because Gyome is the person that saved her and her sister. He had been only a second too late for her parents to be saved, but thinking about it, Gyome said something about if he was as strong as a person, then he could have been here on time, and he apologized. Tanjiro said that he didn't really know if he was comparing himself to him, but he explained that Gyome was pretty tough to fight. Kane asks if they can have a spar after they finish their session in the hot spring, and Tanjiro gladly accepts, saying that he would love to have a little spar with her. 
they leave the hot spring and well they get some food first and then take a rest after about a few hours about four or five Tanjiro gets out a training sword as he agrees to the spar he had remembered his spars with Kanao, so he pretty much knew flower breathing to a T, but now he got to fight the person who had thought Kanao how to use flower breathing. So it was a good way for him to see the difference in their strength, and a good way to see if he could get stronger from this as well. She got up and got a sparring sword as well. They moved outside because if they fought inside, she was a bit scared that they would maybe destroy the place and she didn't want to get scolded for that. They went into the forest and found a bit of an open area. She then got into a posture. It's a posture that Tanjra had seen many times before. It was the first form of flower breathing. Tanjra let it be as he took a breath as well. They both charged at each other, but Tanjo dodged her attack easily. He had seen that her years of experience still had to be built up. After all, she was only just now becoming a Hashra, and whilst her movement was fluid, it could be a lot better. He took this as a chance to train her a bit, as he hit her in some of her open spots with a sword, not even using a breathing technique. She looked back and questioned what he did. He explained to her her weaknesses. She thought about it for a second and corrected them, running at Tantro again. He saw that she learned quickly. She was pretty prod she was a pretty big prodigy, or at least she was a prodigy, and she could learn quite quickly. So he decided this would be a good way for him to teach her. He blocked her attack and then hit her where he found an opening. And this continued on for at least another four hours until she couldn't fight anymore. She was too exhausted. Tanjiro explained that he would be happy to train with her in the future as well if she wanted to, which she thanked him for, seeing that she learned a lot today. He turned around and was preparing to leave, but she quickly asked him how long he would be staying here. She would be staying for another four days as she had to watch this place as part of her mission. He said that he'd be here for at least another week, so if she wanted to keep training, he'd be here for her. She thanked him and said that she would gladly take him up on that offer. The next day they would continue this little sparring session, and, well, Tanjiro saw that she improved a lot. She had definitely trained without him after he had left, but, well, she could still improve more. He showed her some differences in technique. After all, he knew some of the forms of flower breathing. Although he couldn't execute them perfectly, he knew what it looked like for the person to execute them perfectly. So he showed off what he knew. She copied it off, and, well, she just got stronger in the end anyway. By the end of the fourth day, she could hold her own against Tanjiro pretty well, and he'd actually have to use a few sword techniques to actually fight her, as he used sun breathing and water breathing pretty well. In the end, she still lost to Tanjiro, but it was quite the learning experience. They both took a break after the spar and went back to the place they were staying at. They ate some food and then a knock was heard. In came the village chief and a younger-looking boy. The village chief introduced him as Haganezuka. Tanjiro was a bit shocked, but glad to see the person who had made his sword in the past again. The village chief explained how he used Tanjiro's sword as a sort of training for Haganezuka. Even though he had mainly made the sword, he had shown Haganezuka the ropes, which Haganezuka learned a lot. He said that in three or four years, Haganezuka would be able to do the same thing as he did now, and explained how Haganezuka would become Tanjiro's new swordsmith. Tanjiro was happy about this, and said that he looked forward to working together with Haganezuka. He unsheathed 
his new blade. It had the same hilt that it had in its past life, the same black cord wrap. Although the guard was different now. Before it was Rangoku's guard as, well, they needed Rangoku's guard. But now, it was this circular guard. It looked a bit strange. It was like a sun. It had a few offshoots, like a flame, but it was basically just a ball of fire, just more round than the ones on the F Rengoku family crest. The village chief saw Tanjiro looking at it, and he explained how the Demon Slayer Corps had sent it over, saying that it should be added to Tanjiro's guard. He didn't question it, and just continued on. He took the blade out of its scabbard. He held it and it slowly turned into a different color. It turned black, which Haganezuka was upset about. But when Tanjiro squeezed it a bit harder, the blade turned red. Crimson red. Kanae knew about this. The swordsmith village chief knew about this. And, well, Haganezuka knew about it. It was the crimson red blade. That usually children of fire would have. Tanjiro explained how it's a technique, not a not a naturally occurring sword. It could occur naturally, but it's more or less a technique. He explained, as he sheathed the blade again. Haganezuka thanked Tanjiro, bowing before him, as it was quite the nice sight to see. The village chief as well thanked Tanjiro, and Kane asked how the technique worked, though Tanjiro said that she would know about it the moment that the Hashra meeting started. After all, he'd be partaking in it. Now that Tanjiro had his new sword, and that he had finally gotten something to equip himself, he received his first mission. He had to go to a little town. It wasn't that far away, actually, from the swordsmith village, but it was still quite a considerable distance. He made his way over, taking about half a day to get there. When he arrived, he instantly just started investigating like he used to do in the past. It brought back a few memories, those sad and happy ones, weirdly. He had always helped out a lot of people, and that just made him happy, and now it was no different. He went around and helped people out, getting a few whiffs of scent of the demon along the way. It was definitely stalking these people. Night fell, and Tanjiro ran around town, observing. It was at that moment that he smelt something. He made his way over, and there he found a little shop. The shop was not something quite peculiar. He was here earlier to get some onigiri to eat. But now the demon scent was here quite strongly. He entered the shop and got brought with a horrifying sight. It was a demon negotiating with the human about who in the village would be eaten next. The shop owner not only was a shop owner, but was also a sort of leader in the little town, who would govern it a little bit, one could say. And he was negotiating with the demon. It was quite disgusting, Tanjiro thought. The demon noticed Tanjiro's presence and got into battle stance, but in an instant it lost its head as Tanjiro drew his sword and in incredible speed decapitated the demon. He scolded the mayor of the little town, saying that he shouldn't have sacrificed his people, and that he should have fought instead of being so weak-minded. He thought about it because it was something similar to what Giyu had told him way back in the past. The shop owner struggled to find words, but Tanjiro simply left, going outside. His crow landed on his shoulder and he gave the report, noting that the shop owner is a criminal. In the past, there were also humans that would deal with demons, but Tanjiro just thought to himself that now was 
not a time to deal with that. Usually the Demon Slayer core took care of it anyway. Tantra moved on as he had about three days left until the Hashra meeting commenced. So he asked his crow if there were any other missions he could take in that time, yet they were too far away. The crow noted that even for Tondro it would take multiple days to arrive there, and that he should just start heading to the Demon Slayer HQ and rest up a bit. His crow was quite young, and it was different from most other crows. It was actually quite happy to talk with Tondro. More than so, it congratulated him on doing well on his mission, and Tondro just liked to talk. He made his way over to the Demon Slayer HQ, being guided by the crow, as he slowly walked across lands. It was already nighttime, but he might as well have just moved out, he didn't really mind it. He looked at the many fields of rice and other granary and stuff like that being grown. It was quite interesting. He had recalled a memory from the past. It wasn't quite his. He remembered how he had received the memories of his ancestor when he was fighting Muzan way back in the past. How it helped him perfect sun breathing. He wondered if he was connected to the man who had created sun breathing, but he dismissed this thought as he continued on. In the following two days, he arrived at the Demon Slayer HQ where he got allowed a room to stay at. He remembered this place and was quite fond of it. It was his home for the latter part of his previous life. He looked around and made his way into the gardens. As he looked, he saw beautiful flowers in the moonlight. He heard a soft voice behind him. It was a bit similar to what he had heard before, but younger. He turned around and there was Kaguya Biashiki the man who was the leader of the Demon Slayers and, in his previous life, spared Nezuko in a sense. He was eternally grateful to this man. He looked to be in good health. This was probably before he got seriously sick. He talked to Tan Shro in a soft tone, greeting him and thanking him for coming over. Tanjiro had left such a good impression on Kaguya Ubiyashiki that he couldn't forget the movements he displayed back when Tanjiro was only four years old. Ubiyashiki thought that Tanjiro was a prodigy that would lead the Demon Slayers to victory against Muzan, and that they needed him no matter what the cost. That's why he invested so much into Tanjiro already. He made small conversation at first. Tanjiro, of course, talked back as if nothing was wrong. The age difference didn't matter. It felt like two adults were talking to each other as if any other different day. He pointed at Tanjiro's sword and asked if he liked it. Tanjiro held the hilt of his blade and said that the sword was perfect and that it was amazing. That's all he could say. Ubiyashiki then asked if he could unsheath it and show that technique. Tanjiro asked how he knew, and Ubiyashiki said that the village chief of the swordsmiths had reported to him that Tanjiro had a crimson red blade. Tanjiro laughed and said that he wanted to reveal this in the Hashra meeting with some other techniques as well, saying it could strengthen the Demon Slayer core. Ubiyashiki's face lit up a bit. He currently only had about four Hashira, one of which was Gyome. He hadn't really gotten the strength that they had in the past, as one of the Hashira was currently in the process of retiring, and the other, Shinjiro Rengoku, Kyojiro's father, seemed down, like he wasn't going to stay in the Demon Slayer Corps much longer, and that he was going to give up. Ubiyashiki had tried to negate this and had tried to stop this from happening, but from what he could see, it was only a downward spiral. Tanjiro laughed as 
he unsheathed his blade and said that even if it's only Gyomei and Kanae and the other Hashra, that they would be fine since they're pretty strong. Tanjiro held his blade, and the black looked quite beautiful in the moonlight. His blade was different from what it was in the past. It didn't have the little scars on it that had happened before because of the interfering in the process of the sword, and it felt sturdier. He increased his grip strength a bit, and the blade turned crimson red. It looked beautiful. Tanjiro started performing the Hinokami Kagura dance, which left Ubiashiki in this state of pure awe. This eight-year-old, almost nine-year-old, was performing what he could only say was probably sun-breathing before his eyes. Each movement Tanjiro made was beautiful, and the crimson red blade looked beautiful as it glittered in the night sky. Tanjiro stopped when he reached the twelfth dance move, as Ubiashiki bowed to him and thanked him for the experience, saying it was quite beautiful and that he would love to see it again in the future. Tanjiro laughed a bit, chuckled. As he said that, he would gladly perform it in the future again. It was around this time that Ubiashiki thought to himself that Tanjiro should definitely become a Hashira in the future. He had seen the Hashira's train, and Tanjiro's movement was no less. He'd even say that Tanjiro's movement was better, but maybe he should build up more experience. That was what Ubiashiki thought. Tanjiro sheathed his blade again as he proceeded to walk around the garden, together with Ubiashiki. They had a light conversation about things that happened, and Tanjiro decided to reveal what he had been hiding all along. He told Ubiashiki, straight up looked him in the eye, and spoke, I know what happens in the future. Ubiashiki questioned what Tanjiro meant, and Tanjiro clarified, saying that he's from the future, or well, that he went back in time. Ubiashiki is more confused, and starts saying that that is pretty much impossible, but then he thinks about it. He himself could peek into the future, or at least had dreams that were sort of a clairvoyance moment. As he spoke, he said, if he could truly trust Tanjiro. As they're walking, Tanjiro starts telling his story. They walk about two or three hours, and Ubiashiki, the entire way of their walk, listens intently to Tanjiro. Tanjiro explains everything from the past, from his family just being normal charcoal burners, to then all of a sudden being attacked by Muzan Kibutsuji, to then Tanjiro's sister becoming a demon and being spared by Giyu Tomioka, a future Hashira, stuff like that. He kept it pretty vague, not giving too much detail in certain points as he didn't know if those events would still happen, but thinking about it logically, Ubiyashiki came to the conclusion that what Tanjiro was saying could be correct. He had already heard of the great strides that some of the demon slayers that were currently active were making, like Giyu Tomioka, and even now Sabito, but Sabito had survived final selection, and it's at that point that Ta he realizes what Tanjiro had done. Tanjiro had changed the past. He had made it so that Sabito and Makomo had survived final selection. He, after his explanation of them training him, it made sense that he would want to repay them. It made him happy because... Sabito was a prodigy amongst prodigies. It was already estimated that in the next two months he could become a Hashira, and if he really tried, probably in the next month or so. Whilst Giyu Tomioka was no less. They were both water-breathing style users, but they had different aspects, 
Gyu had become more calm after realizing that his style of water breathing was more defense and counterattacking, whilst Sabito always used water breathing in a very aggressive manner. It was two sides of a coin. Ubiashiki thanked Tanjiro for saving their lives, or at least training them to become even stronger. Tanjiro said it was nothing and that he will continue doing so. He would hate to see untimely deaths after all. It is at this point that Ubiashiki realizes that Tanjiro's value skyrocketed. He has knowledge of the future and he even knows when and where Muzan Kibutsuji will show up. After all, he attacked his family, so if they laid an ambush ahead of time, maybe they could stop him. It was a distant thought, now they should just focus on the present, making the Demon Slayer stronger. Tanjiro spoke and said that he would reveal certain things on the Hashra meeting, but that he didn't want to reveal that he's from the future. He wanted to start fresh in a sense. He would share the information, but he wouldn't say how he got it or stuff like that. Ubiashiki respected his wishes and said that he himself would keep it a secret. They made their way over and arrived back at a house after finishing their tour of the garden. They ate some food and continued their talk. The next day would be the Hashra meeting, so they went to bed early. Tanjiro woke up that morning, and like any other morning, he would start his training. He first started with some push-ups, some sit-ups, some squats, some curl-ups, stuff like that. And then he would swing his sword, increasing his precision. He had the skills, but he still had to make his body strong. He continued with his training as he went on a run. The Hashra meeting would be in about an hour, so he wanted to take a little run through the garden and then prepare for the Hashra meeting. He started running as he saw a familiar face. He came to a stop next to a taller man. It was Gyome. Gyome turned around and faced into the direction that Tanjiro stood in. He greeted Tanjiro. Gyome always felt the air around people and said that Tanjiro had this air around him that was always so friendly and warm. He talked to Tanjiro and realized that Tanjiro was exercising, saying he wouldn't mind running along. They started the exercise and both ran. Gyome was physically strong, so he kept up easily. They kept talking as they ran. It was around this time that Gyome asked Tanjiro if he could have another spar with him because he wanted to see if he made any strides in his progress and in his training. Tanjiro asked him why him specifically and Gyome explained that Tanjiro was already so strong and basically at Hashra level when he was four years old that even four more years would probably make him so much stronger in the end. Tanjiro chuckled and said that he would gladly spar with Gyome again. They continued their run as they came across another Hashra, Shinjiro Rengoku, Kyojiro's father. The man looked at Gyome and Tanjiro. He didn't look down on Gyome or Tanjiro. In fact, he looked at Tanjiro with this kind of envy. Tanjiro realized what had happened. It was because of his mark. He put his hand over the mark, and it's as if Tanjiro read Shinjiro's mind. That was the thought that Shinjiro ran through his head. He was surprised that he knew that he was looking at the mark. Tanjiro greeted him politely, and to return the favor, Shinjiro did the same. Gyome also said his hellos, and they continued with their run. Shinjiro joined them. Seeing that Tanjiro was doing the run, he thought maybe if he followed this person who had already such a strong aura when he was four years old, maybe he could learn the secrets. Maybe he could learn how to become stronger. He started running along with Tanjiro and Gyome, and their talk continued. Shinjiro asked a lot of questions about Tanjiro's breathing style and stuff like that. 
Tanjiro says that it's called the Hinokami Kagura, but that it has another name as well, which Shinjiro asks what's the other name. Tanjiro explains that some people may call it sun breathing. It's at that point that Shinjiro realizes that Tanjiro is a chosen one, in a sense. He gets a bit jealous and even a bit mad, but Tanjiro explains that every breathing style is versatile, and that not only sun breathing is a good breathing style, because he saw that Shinjiro's face had this look of disappointment. Shinjiro took it to heart, a sun breathing user had just told him that even flame breathing was a strong breathing style. So he cast away his doubt for a bit, and just ran along, continuing the chat, which the mood turned up. Even though the mood was down a bit, it had now gone back up. They continued their run and arrived back at the house that they started at. They freshened themselves up and prepared for the Hashra meeting. When they arrived, they saw two other Hashra. Now Tanjiro didn't recognize these two, but they seemed strong in a way. It's at that moment that Kaguya Ubiyashiki walked in. Kanaya was there as well as they all bowed down in front of Kaguya. Kaguya announced something first. He announced the retirement of one of the Hashira, who stood up and bowed down in front of Fubiashiki. He spoke his farewells and gave his advice to the other people there. Next, Kaguya spoke and said that he would like to announce the newest Hashira, Kanae Kocho, the flower Hashira. She stood up and bowed instantly, saying that she would try her best to fight for the Demon Slayer Corps in a bit of an embarrassing way, which made her face red, but the others all just chuckled a bit. The mood was still very light. They continued the meeting, explaining certain things to Kanae that most Hashra should know, stuff like that. It's at that moment that the other Hashra that Tanjiro didn't recognize, he was wearing a gray kimono, asked about what Tanjiro was doing there, since he wasn't a Hashira. Kaguya then explained that Tanjiro was a bit of a special case, that he's as strong as a Hashra, but that he hasn't gotten the experience or the demon kill count yet. He is the highest rank of Kinoe, but he has received a special sort of title, and that he's an honorary Kinoe until the time that he shows enough kill count or until he kills a lower moon. Then he'll be promoted to a uh, Hashira. The Hashira is a bit mad, saying that Tanjo's receiving special favor in a corporation that should be fair. Kaguya wants to speak, but Gyome opens his mouth first. Gyome speaks and says that he fought Tanjiro four years ago, which confuses the other Hashra, who had only been a Hashra for two years. He was originally a Tsugoku who had replaced one of the Hashras who had died, one of the Hashras that witnessed Tanjiro's battle. The Hashra then asks if Tanjiro is that boy who beat Gyome, right before he became a Hashra, and Gyome nods. Gyome became a Hashra right about two weeks after Tanjiro had left, and the respect for him was quite high. Everybody in the Demon Slayer Corps respected him as he was currently the second strongest Demon Slayer, second to none after Shinjiro Rengoku, but most people could probably say that he's equally as strong. He still had to build up more experience, and he was still refining his body every day. But for a blind man, he was pretty strong. The other Hashra, who had been a replacement Hashra technically at Sugoko, shut his mouth. He himself, technically speaking, had only replaced a Hashra and hadn't built up the achievements yet. He had killed a lower moon, but that was about it. Ubiyashiki continues, saying that Tanjiro even became stronger now, saying he witnessed 
Tanjiro's breathing style and that it was beautiful. He doesn't know much of swordsmanship himself, but it looked almost perfect to him, is what he says. It is at that time that he looks at Tanjiro and asks him to reveal some of the information he has. So Tanjiro stands up, the other Hashra doing the exact same. He starts explaining his situation. He says that he's Tanjiro Kamado and that his breathing style is called the Hinokami Kagura, or its other name is Sun Breathing, which is a surprise only to the unnamed Hashira. Tanjiro then reveals other things like the Demon Slayer mark on his head, the Crimson Red Blade, which he reveals by unsheathing his blade and gripping his blade, which also surprises the all the Hashira, besides Kanae, who had seen it in action firsthand. And, well, he reveals some other information, stuff like the see-through world, basically tips to help them become stronger. It was this that Shinjiro was talking about in his own mind, the thought of becoming stronger by watching and observing this Sunbreath user. He remarked how much of a prodigy Tanjiro was and how insanely smart he must be to figure all of this out. He asks him how he did and Tanjiro just says that it was something he had to learn in a very hard manner. Speaking a bit of truth as it was from the past. They continue talking and eventually it comes to a standstill. Tanjiro revealed some of the techniques that he had built up over the years and the other Hashiro revealed some th tricks that he they had been saving. In fact, Chinjiro even revealed all of his techniques that he used and they all talked about the breathing styles and stuff like that. Tanjiro then proceeded to speak with Ubiashiki about certain events that would be partaking but that was about it. In the next few moments, they talk about strength and training of the Demon Slayers. Ubiashiki thought it would be a good idea to have the current Hashra do a sort of Hashra training, as well as train the Tsugoko and Kinoe ranked Slayers. Tanjiro thought this was a great idea and backed this up, but the other Hashra were skeptical. They hardly had time for their own Tsugoko or their own people they were training, but it could be interesting. They had done this in the past, but only a very few times, and Ubiashiki was the one who wanted to bring this back more and more, almost doing it annually. Tanjiro backed him up, saying it's a good idea, and thus Gyome and Kanae said the same thing. Following behind, Shinjiro backed them up as well, making it a 3 versus 1 on the vote. Next, Ubiashiki spoke about some points that Tanjiro didn't really know, but it was mainly rumors about upper moon and lower moon locations, and Tanjiro just made notes of it. Thinking back to the past, he already maybe knew where some of the lower moon were, so he just have to go back to those locations and take care of them before any other people would get injured. Next up was a point that Ubiashiki had made, especially by Gyome's request. Gyome had requested a spar with Tanjiro that would be spectated by everyone around them. Since he was equal in strength to Chinjiro in most people's eyes, he could learn from this a lot, and if Tanjiro truly is stronger than them, then Shinjiro and the others could also learn by just observing. Ubiashiki as well wanted to see this, so he allowed it. They moved over to a bigger area where the two could spar. Gyome pulled out his axe and his mace. Tanjiro remembered these two, and he just unsheathed his own blade, gripping it as it turned crimson red. Ubiashiki started a countdown, and after 10 seconds passed, the fight started. Tanjiro rushed at Gyome with great speed, using the first form of sun breathing, dance, slashing vertically at Gyome. Gyome blocked with his axe and sent out the spiked ball that was on a chain. Tanjiro blocked it and jumped off of it, as he was now in the air. 
Gyome took this chance to throw his axe at Tanjiro as his spiked ball was returning to him. Tanjiro deflected the blow and then pulled the chain as he grabbed it, making Gyome fly to him. Gyome thought that this was it. He now had Tanjiro in a bind. However, Tanjiro remembered what Gyome had done to Muzan. It was one of the moves where he would trap the opponent with the chains. He remembered this as Gyome came in. He jumped on Gyome's shoulder, surprising Gyome at the speed at which Tanjiro adapted. He proceeded to use Firewheel as he slashed at Gyome's back. They both landed on the ground and Gyome wanted to continue the fight. Gyome sent out his axe as Tanjiro evaded the attack easily, grabbing it once again. This time, Gyome pulled Tanjiro towards him as he sent both his spiked ball and axe at Tanjiro once they got back in his hands. Tanjiro, however, used Burning Bone Summer Sun, cut the chains up, breaking Gyome's weapon as his blade was now against Gyome's neck. Of course, he wouldn't continue as he didn't want to kill Gyome, but this left the other startled. Gyome was beaten and it looked almost easy. It was as if Tanjiro didn't use any effort, yet although he did, it was quite a good fight. Gyome thanked Tanjiro for the enlightenment, as he saw what he could do better in the fight. Shinjiro was amazed, but at the same time, confused and jealous. How did an eight-year-old boy defeat someone ten years older than him? However, he left this thought behind. Ubiashiki announced the results as Tanjiro won, and the other Hashral approached Tanjiro, asking how he became so strong and if he had any training tips. Tanjiro just explained his training routine and things he did, and for the rest, they'd have to figure stuff out on their own. Shinjiro came up to Tanjiro and spoke. He asked if he could come to his mansion, because he would like for Tanjiro to meet his son, Kyojuro Rengoku, as he would like Tanjiro to maybe give him some pointers on training, because he thinks that Kyojuro could probably learn sun breathing if given the right tools. Tanjiro agrees and says that he would like to meet Kyojuro, thinking back to his friend and mentor who had been his inspiration in the past. Tanjiro would move out together with Chinjiro, heading towards the Flame Hashiro's mansion. It took about half a day for them to arrive, after which they got greeted warmly by a woman who looked a bit sickly and a young boy. Chinjiro smiled. It was a smile Tanjiro hadn't seen before. It was a truly peaceful and happy smile. When they truly arrived towards the two, he greeted them. Shinjiro quickly introduced Tanjiro, explaining who he is and how he knew him. He explains how Tanjiro is a demon slayer, not just anyone at that, that he's currently the strongest demon slayer in the core, saying how he's at least Hashira level even though he's only ranked Kinoe. Kyojiro admires him for that, seeing that Tanjiro is such a young boy. Unconsciously, this had lit a fire in Kyojiro, seeing that Tanjiro was younger than him and already stronger than him. He knew that he could get stronger too, and he wanted to make his dad proud. It was pretty much left beside, though. He quickly talked to Tanjiro and greeted him. His mother did the same, though Shinjiro would intercept, asking her to go back to bed. She looked a bit ill. Rather, she had bags under her eyes, which made Tanjiro worry a bit. They quickly entered inside the mansion. There, Shinjiro went over to check on a baby crib. Looking over, Tanjiro saw a young baby boy. This must have been Rengoku's little brother. Senjuro. He didn't say anything, but he just gave a warm smile, as he always used to do. 
Kyojiro asked Tanjiro how he got so strong, interested in hearing anything tips related or any techniques he could learn. Tanjiro simply told him the training he did, and other things like that. When it came to, though, he revealed that he was a user of sun breathing, which Kyojiro knew about. His father, after all, had been studying the records right in front of his nose, though it made him quite angry from time to time. Tanjiro, however, said stuff about it actually not being too difficult to comprehend, but that it's maybe just something that is too hard to learn for other people. He couldn't really explain it in a sense. Though, before Kyojiro could ask anything, Shinjiro interrupted, saying that he had invited Tanjiro to eat and to train the next day. After all, they had just had a pretty hectic day. So, Rengoku's mother got up. She was sitting next to Kyojiro, but something was different. She was faltering a bit in her steps, but she still wanted to go make food. When Shinjiro told her to sit down, she refused. After all, there was a guest, and she would not have someone else make food. She would only have the best for a guest. Which made Tanjiro chuckle a bit. Shinjiro went away and helped her, leaving Tanjiro with Kyojiro alone. They talked and talked about techniques and tips and breathing styles and training techniques and stuff like that. And Tanjiro just explained that when he was learning breathing, he learned multiple different styles so that he could make his own, in a sense. Because yes, he could use sun breathing, and yes, that is the strongest, but he also had a grip on water breathing. Heck, he even knew thunder breathing techniques, though not as many since he had only learned them from Zenitsu, who could only perform the first form. Rengoku then asked a very heart touching question to Tanjiro. He asked if he could become someone strong like him. And Tanjiro thought about it for a second and then he answered with confidence. He said that Rengoku could become someone even stronger, seeing the potential within the boy. This lit a bit of a blaze inside of Kyojiro, seeing as his father spoke highly of Tanjiro, and this person had just said that he had the potential to surpass him. So he didn't want to disappoint Tanjiro, saying that from now on he would train harder. After a while, Shinjiro and Kyojiro's mother would come back. They put down some food bowls with rice and some tempura and other specialties that she had made. Tanjiro thanked her for the food and gave his prayers, after which he started to eat like the rest. Instantly, when he took a bite, he was in heaven. This food was godly. It was amazingly good, to the point where it reminded him of his mother's cooking. He hadn't had it in a while, and he really wanted to eat it again. It made a tear come in his eye. He was still a child, and even though he had the memories of a young adult and, heck, the experiences of a veteran, he still was very emotional. They continued chatting whilst they ate. Tanjiro was quite the enjoyable person to talk to, and nobody could really harbor ill feelings towards him. Shinjiro was also being more in a better mood than usual. They finished food, and Shinjiro brought Tanjiro to the guest room, where he was allowed to stay. He told them that they would be getting up early, because training always started early in the morning. Tanjiro said that that was fine, as he was used to it. So he went to bed. The next morning, he woke up. He found them already training outside. They started really early. It was maybe two hours before Tantra had woken up. He thought that he had woken up early, that he had been before them, but no, that wasn't true. They always started training very early, that's why Kyojiro's training schedule was so hard, because he had made his own training even harder than what his dad had given them. Tanjiro joined in and started training with them. They had a few light spars, and Kyojiro learned a lot from sparring against Tanjiro. 
Then Shinjiro asked if he could perform sun breathing for them. And so he did. He performed all 12 segments of the dance, of the Hinokami Kagura dance, in other words, sun breathing. Shinjiro was astonished. He looked at the record that he had, bringing it out and looking at each of the pages, looking at all of the forms listed there and how the dances were made, and he thought to himself that this was quite interesting. Now he understood it a bit more, but he still couldn't perform the dance, let alone perform sun breathing anyway. Kyojiro asked if he could give it a go, so Tanjiro decided that he'd give him a bit of the training. He showed him how to do the dance, each part separately. He first did the first segment, dance, a vertical slash whilst dashing forward in a sense. Kyojiro tried to mimic the movement, but it was too hard for him to get it on the first try. Tanjiro said that that was fine and that he actually performed pretty well. He thought that Kyojiro might be able to use sun breathing, but who knows. He explained everything, every dance, and he showed it. He even showed how to use the breathing technique. He showed all of this, and whilst he was doing it, Shinjiro was taking notes whilst Kyojiro was actually learning. Tanjiro continued on as he showed more and more. He even eventually it led on to explain how the Demon Slayer marked work transparent world and other stuff like that, even the crimson red blade which he showed. Kyojiro took mental notes of all of this. Tanjiro hadn't seen it, but he had left quite the mental image on Kyojiro's mind. Even if Kyojiro was older, he respected Tanjiro a lot. Tanjiro told Kyojiro that even though he had told him all of the moves and how to do them of sun breathing, that Kyojiro would make a really strong flame breath user, and that he shouldn't just dismiss his own skill. Kyojiro smiled at this, and thanked Tanjiro, saying that he's reassured that someone believes in his skill. Shinjiro asked Tanjiro why he was so sure about that, and then Tanjiro explained how each breath style has certain aspects that make them stronger, even that they could be stronger than sun breathing in the end. Which Shinjiro tries to counter-argue, saying that sun breathing is just way stronger, but Tanjiro says that it depends, really, on the person who uses the breathing technique. He even says that he himself isn't as talented as most people make him out to be, saying that his father is way more talented than he himself is, even though he wasn't given the rank, and that his father would probably reach the rank of Kinoe or even Hashira in a few weeks' time, if possible, although he would be taking care of his family more. Shinjiro is left a bit taken aback, you know, say sun breath users saying this, but he decides that he shouldn't be fussing over a breathing style, as he just decides that flame breathing was given to him and that he should just make it stronger. After all, there's that stone Hashira that is now surpassing him in strength. He obviously hasn't reached his limit yet. After a few more hours of sparring and talking and doing everything they do, Tanjiro would leave. He had his next mission to attend to after all. He'd have to go west, towards a village far, far away. The Demon Slayer Corps had heard rumors, rumors of a strong demon staying there. They had already sent out a few lower-ranked slayers, about Mizunoto rank, but they had gone missing, and there was no report saying anything about them, so it was now Tanjiro's job to go there. Tanjiro made his way over to the village, arriving after a day or so. He had arrived at night time, which was perfect. He instantly started sniffing out the demon right now. He started patrolling the area. At one point, he smelled a very foul scent. It was a very strong demon scent. He judged it to be at least a lower moon rank demon. There's no other way for it to be like that. He quickly got his crow to come to him, as he then reported the situation, saying that it's at least a lower-ranked demon. 
the crow headed back to HQ as it would go get reinforcements. However, Tantra would not sit still and let this demon kill people. He made his way over to the scent, landing at the porch of a building. He'd open a door to go inside, and there he'd find a demon who was torturing a young girl. The demon looked over at Tandro, on its eye was engraved Lower 3. The demon asked who Tandro was, and if he was here to interrupt his playtime. Tandro got visibly angry, as his mark flared up once more. He took a breath, and in a second, he cut off the demon's arm, grabbing the girl and making his way through the house at running speed, eventually finding the parents' room, where he dropped off the girl. They both woke up and were angry at Tanjiro for breaking in. However, when the demon came over and attacked Tanjiro using his blood demon art, their tone quickly changed to that of screams of horror. Tanjiro told them to get out of here as he would take care of the demon. They did so without a second thought. He got into a stance and took a breath, reaching towards the demon. Tanjiro's strength right now was definitely enough to take on Gyutaro at the least, though his body still had to catch up and his movements were not as perfect as they were before because he still had to get used to his smaller body, so he missed the lower moon's head by a hair. This was primarily because of his short arms. The lower moon didn't let this chance get to waste, using its blood demon art to attack Tanjiro. However, Tanjiro blocked in time, making his way outside of the building. Once they were outside and into the streets, the demon asked who Tanjiro was, because he had displayed speed that the demon couldn't even comprehend, and he needed this information. Tanjiro spoke as he introduced himself as Tanjiro Kamado, and that that is all the information the demon would get. The demon didn't let this be as he attacked Tanjiro again. He introduced himself as Rokoro, Lower Moon 3, and he started to gloat right after, saying how he would torture the people that he let escape today. As he started saying despicable things one after the other, however, Tanjo didn't leave it be. He actually got angry quite a bit more. His blade fired up red as it turned crimson. At that moment, Rokuro, Lower Moon 3's body, started to shake violently. He questioned what happened, and then he realized that it was Master Muzan's cells. They were scared of Tanjiro. He didn't quite know why, but... These memories started flashing in his head as Tandro's movements looked exactly like the movements of the memory of Master Muzan. Rokuro was frozen still, and in a second Tandro decapitated him, leaving behind quite a powerful shockwave. Rokuro started to disintegrate, and couldn't even say anything before he was fully gone. Tandro put his blade away, sheathing it once more. After a while, other demon slayers arrived, some of which were Kinoe rank, some of which even lower ranks, but that didn't quite matter. Within their ranks were some familiar faces. Tanjiro came up to them familiar faces and said hello. It was Sabito, Makomo, and Kiyu. They had grouped up and formed a slayer group, in a sense. They still did their individual missions, but they would also team up on missions that seemed harder. Tanjiro greeted them and they spoke. They asked what had happened and Tanjiro explained that he had just defeated Lower Moon 3. His crow quickly landed on his shoulder and asked for him to give a report, which he did. He explained everything that happened in the short situation. The crow quickly told Tanjiro that he would be teaming up with Sabito, Makomo, and Giyu for his next mission, as he, t as he told them to go south. Right after, the crow would depart, as it was headed back to HQ to make a report. Tanjiro set out with Makomo, Giyu, and Sabito. They asked him how he got so strong as to take care of uh, Lower Moon so easily. And Tanjiro just explained that he just got angry because he explained what the demon told him, which made Giyu quite angry as it brought back memories of his sister. 
Sabidoi told them that they should best not linger. The next village was a few hours away, and if they still made it, then they could maybe still catch the demon this night. So they set out, quickly arriving after what was only two hours, because Tanjo had set the pace and started running. They all knew that he was definitely Hashura level, but they didn't think that he would torture them by taking the lead. When they arrived at the village, they started looking for the demon, any clues. Tanjo used his scent whilst Giyu went over to some of the night shops that were still open and asked about rumors and stuff like that. He did that together with Makomo whilst Sabito did it on his own. Giyu still struggled a bit with talking to strangers, but that's why Makomo was there alongside him. She was able to teach him that, whilst Sabito was perfectly fine on his own. They didn't quite find anything from the villagers, but Tanjo had once again gotten a scent. It was not as strong as the Lower Moon 3, but still quite strong. They quickly all made their way over, finding another lower-ranked demon. She was just sitting there, though, in the building, looking at the slayers. She was scared, terrified, as if... Someone had threatened her before their arrival. She was murmuring something about Master Muzan, which got, which got Sabito to ask her where Master Muzan was. She then realized that the Slayers were there. She was so out of it that she hadn't even seen them right in front of her. She got up and got into a battle position. However, she was only lower rank 6. Tanjiro felt no real threat from her, though when she used her blood demon art, things quickly turned around. She made them feel dizzy somehow. Her blood demon art was as if they were intoxicated. The slayers all tried to fight, but she was quite strong, actually, and they sometimes hit their own. Sabito would sometimes hinder Tanjiro, and Gi would hinder Makomo by accidents. They all just focused up, as they eventually got the hang of it, and together ended up beating her, with Sabito hitting the final blow. Out of all their ranks, currently Tanjiro was the highest strength, whilst Sabito was also Kinoe rank, but Tanjiro was already seen as a Hashira and he was a special ranked Kinoe, so his case was special, though currently Sabito was also a Kinoe. He had been hunting demons non-stop, mostly going on solo missions whilst Makomo and Giyu stayed together, even though they teamed up for certain missions. He was currently Kinoe, so this meant that he could probably become a Hashra just from this, whilst Makomo and Giyu were both three ranks lower than that. Their progress was insanely fast, is what Tanjiro thought, but then he remembered that they were pretty much prodigies, all of them, even Giyu. And now Giyu wasn't doubting his own skills anymore like he was in the past, so it made a whole world of differences. Sabito's crow also quickly went out to make the report, and, well, they got told to go back to Demon Slayer HQ where they would stay for the next few days. They arrived at the Demon Slayer HQ after two days of traveling. The road was a bit more bumpy and they had made a few stops, actually killing another rogue demon that the Demon Slayer HQ didn't even know of on their way. Though this one was just a normal demon, it just exhausted them somehow. They continued making their way to the Demon Slayer HQ, where they then proceeded to stay for the next few days. A Hashira meeting was called. In it, Tanjiro and Sabito were invited. Questioning why they were invited, or why Sabito was invited, they went. After about a week of waiting, the Hashira meeting was called. There. Both Tanjiro and Sabito finally got ranked up to Hashira for both defeating a Kizuki member, or one of the 12 Kizuki. Tanjiro became the Sun Hashira, corresponding with his 
Hinokami Kagura or sun breathing, whilst Sabito became the water hashra, the symbol on his hand representing a very turbulent whirlpool as if it was never ending. They both graciously accepted their hashra positions, and they got welcomed warmly into the ranks of the hashra. Shinjiro even made a comment saying that it took long enough for Tanjiro to finally become a hashra, saying that he was already the strongest amongst them. But Kaguya and the others just laughed, saying that he still had to go through procedure no matter what. Ubiyashiki then says that they'll be doing a hashra training once again, because now they have more hashra and it would be more beneficial to learn each other's styles a bit, and that all of the other highest ranked slayers will be taking part in it. He tells them it will be taking place in a year from now, as the Hashra still have to grow stronger themselves, as he tells them all the specific rules of the Hashra and things like that. He tells them it'll be a year because he wants to see if any other Hashra will be joining before that time, saying that there's quite a lot of people currently that have the potential to definitely become a Hashra. He then dismisses the Hashra, but keeping Tanjiro back. He speaks with Tanjiro about a possible scenario. It's the scenario of setting up an ambush trap against Muzan. He says that they already know where Muzan will be in the future, and that they might as well just attack him then. Tanjiro says that that's a good idea, but that the Hashra will have to train a lot because Muzan cannot die of being decapitated. This makes Ubiyashiki nervous, but he just says that we'll ha they'll have to train harder so they can fight the entire night, which Tanjiro agrees upon, saying that it would be beneficial if the Demon Slayers could do that. Their conversation ends, and Ubiyashiki personally gives Tanjiro his next mission, which is to go east. A journey that will take him multiple days, but Ubiyashiki thinks that it will be a good journey, seeing as the reports coming from it say that it's an, another high-level demon, and that Tanjiro has to take care of it. Tanjiro accepts, and he proceeds to set out. Tanjiro had received his next mission. He had to go north, to towards an area that he had gone to once before, the Entertainment District. He didn't quite know for certain if he would be fighting Daki or Gyutaro. He definitely could find them, and he already knew who she was posing as, but he'd have to be careful not to arouse too much suspicion. And while he didn't know if he could fight Daki and Gyutaro on his own, he's quite strong now, and he's definitely able to fight Upper Moons, but would he be able to take them on, on his own? He set out, and it took him about a week to get there. It was a long journey, and Tanjiro had made a few stops to help some villagers along the ways, as he passed by a few villages. He arrived at the entertainment district. There, he started looking around for the demon. He got a few scents whilst walking around. He recognized one of these. It was Daki's, but it was a bit different. It was definitely the Oiron. She had gone on a parade just before and her scent still lingered in the air. Another was quite the foul scent. It was another demon. Though it was surprising, he thought, why would there be another demon here? As there was already an upper moon here and usually demons got quite territorial. Tanjiro decided to just wait out for the night. And so he did. He went around and a lot of people asked him a lot of questions, whether or not he was lost, and also why he was carrying a katana. After all, he was still a child. He was only eight years old, almost nine years old at this point in time, and people often thought of him as a lost kid. I asked him where his parents were. A lot of the ladies who were serving men were sad for the boy. They wanted to help him out and try and help find his mother, but he told them that he was fine, and that he was just here to scout, which they didn't quite understand, but he just left it be. Night fell, and he made his patrol, eventually catching a very strong scent. He made his way as he ran through all the alleyways and then jumped up on the roof of the building and started hopping from roof to roof. Eventually, he came to this building, 
The scent was strong, but there was surprisingly a second scent. Daki. He jumped down to the balcony and opened the balcony door, seeing Daki killing another demon. Another female demon. Saying stuff like this was her territory and sh that the other demon should stay out of it before killing her. She then looked at Tanjiro and questioned what he was doing there. Then seeing his outfit, she remarked that he was a demon slayer. Though she laughed, saying that the demon slayers had fallen, as they even had now a child. Though, when Tanjiro unsheathed his blade, she got scared. His image, which was very close to Yoroichi, made her blood cells tremble. He had the same scar, the same air around him, and, well, he had this air around him that made him seem terrifying. Tanjiro took a breath and spoke. Hmm, will you bring out Yutaro, he said as he pointed his sword at her neck. In an instant, she froze a bit. Not only was something wrong, it was like her blood cells were screaming. They were in agonizing pain. But also, how did this boy know about Gyutaro? It was confusing since Gyutaro had fused with Daki, and, and that pretty much masked his presence. Though Tanjiro spoke that she would lose pretty easily if she didn't pull out Gutro. Daki got angry and proceeded to dash towards Tanjiro. However, in a second, her head came off of her body. Tanjiro, even now, even though he's a child, was definitely on the level of a Hashira. Definitely surpassed a few people in the past. As he had the same skill slot as when he fought against Muzan way back then. But now... The only difference was that he didn't have the muscle or the body strength to follow up with it, though he had already adapted to that by fighting constantly with his younger body, and he was adapting every day, getting even stronger every day. His body was in way better shape than what it was when he was younger, and so his growth was also developed way better because of that. He made sure to eat healthy, and he didn't let anything stop him from gaining strength. Daki was crying out, saying that she couldn't be this weak because she just got her head decapitated by an eight-year-old boy. Tanjiro looked at her and still felt pity. He remembered how she died in the past and how she yelled at her brother and that they couldn't make amends. In a second, though, slashes came towards Tanjiro as he deflected them. Out came Gyutaro. He looked at Tanjiro and knew that he wasn't a match for him. He didn't exactly know why he knew that Tanjiro was stronger. It was like the battled spirit that he had built up for a hundred plus years was screaming at him. He was terrified. He tried to compose himself, as his cells were also screaming. Tantro looked a lot like Yoroichi. He didn't look much like what he did before, as his body had developed more. His hair was also longer, as he let it grow out. Not only that, but him having the exact same mark really triggered the Muzan cells. Tantro got into another stance took a breath and in an instant rushed at Gyutaro, who tried blocking Tantro's attack, though Tantro would slice off one of his arms. Gyutaro would yell at Daki and tell her that she should heal her head, as they need to prepare for the fight, as he needs to team up with her. She instantly got serious as she put her head back on, still crying and weeping. These bands came back up to her and her hair started turning white. Tanjiro remembered this. She had divided her powers in a bit and that's why she wasn't as strong before. They started fighting together. Daki would send out these bands towards Tanjiro which he could cut easily. It was a joke to compare his former self to what he was now. At least his former self when he fought against these two before. 
He cut through the bends easily, reaching Daki and almost cutting her neck, though Gutro intervened, sending his slashes and trying to push Tanjiro away. Tanjiro decided to take this fight seriously, even more so. He didn't want to repeat the amount of deaths that happened last time, and he wanted to take care of this quickly. He took a breath and focused. His blade turned crimson red, and he entered the transparent world. He looked at their muscles and saw the attacks they were about to do, easily dodging through most of the bands and swords that they had sent after him, deflecting a few because Gyutaro could home in on him. Then, when he got close enough, when Gyutaro tried to slash at him, he easily blocked it and even slashed off Gyutaro's hands. Eventually, he could be able to decapitate Daki as he kept this fight going. Multiple minutes had already passed, but he did decapitate her as he sent her head flying with a kick. Gyutaro panicked as he tried to catch his sister's head, but Tanjiro kept him at bay. Their fight would just start. Gyutaro kicked Tanjiro outside as their fight was now in the open roads. Some people came outside and Tanjiro yelled out that they should enter back inside. Gyutaro took this chance as he decided to send slashes towards the people that came outside, distracting Tanjiro long enough that he could get his sister's head back on her shoulders. Which worked. Tanjiro decided to take the hit as he now had wounded himself a bit. It wasn't bad as he just dodged the attack by pushing a person away, but his shoulder was cut slightly. Yudro thought this was a good thing because this meant that they did harm Tanjiro and that he wasn't invulnerable, so this fight could continue. However, Tanjiro looked around him. He didn't completely stop all the blades and there was still a lot of death. The toll was around the tens or maybe twenty people that had died, but he heard the cries of the people around him. The houses were about to collapse, and Tanjiro felt despair. He had gotten stronger, a lot stronger than what he was before. Though he wasn't quite at the strength level yet he was when he fought against Muzan, he felt despair because he couldn't save the people around him once more. A lot of people died, and Tanjiro was mad. Even though he was currently using the transparent world and in the selfless state, he had this anger radiating off of him. It made Gyutaro shiver. Even Daki, who came back with her head, was shivering as well. Their Muzan cells were going insane. They were shaking violently. Tanjiro took a breath as his veins looked as if they were about to burst. And in an instant, he would dash towards Daki, taking a breath and performing the third form of the Hinokami Kagura, decapitating her almost instantly. He had her head in his other free hand as Gyutro screamed at him to give it back, though Tanjiro didn't reply. He started talking, his words overlapping with memories. Gyutro was shivering. He had killed countless Hashira, but this one is memories that were resurfacing. Muzan's memories of this individual, Yoroichi Tsujikuni. He was terrified. Yutaro was terrified. However, before he could make a move, he was so frozen that he didn't even realize he had already been decapitated by Tanjiro. Tanjiro dropped. Daki's head next to Gyutaro's, and slowly walked away, wishing them well, as they only had each other. Gyutaro and Daki started to disintegrate. Gyutaro cried out to his sister, who was blaming 
herself and him for their weakness. Though, they talked before finally disappearing into the abyss. Tanjiro continued on. He helped some of the people that were wounded and that were still breathing. Some Kakushi came up and asked him for a report, his crow also landing. He explained everything that had happened, and the crow said it would make the report to HQ. Yet before it did, Tanjiro handed it a vial, saying that it should give it to Kaguya Ubiashiki as it's the blood of an upper moon, saying that he'll know what to do with it. The crow left, as Tanjiro and the Kakushi continued helping everybody. Another Kakushi attended to Tanjiro's shoulder, but he tried to insist that he was fine, though the Kakushi demanded him to give the shoulder. Tanjiro got called back to HQ after a few days. The people were still in shock and he was still helping out, even in the morning. Though he did. He went back to HQ where he got welcomed warmly saying that he did great as they finally defeated an upper moon, which they hadn't been defeated in the last 100 years. Tanjiro just thanks everybody for the warm welcome and tells them that he'll be training for a while, which he leaves. Everybody sees that he's a bit down. It's sadness, but they feel like he's going a bit hard on himself. It's at that moment that Kanae's sister walks up to Kane and asks her if that other Hashiro was alright. Shinobu Kocho, Kane told her that they should visit Tanjiro and maybe talk to him, ask him what happened. They had already heard the report and they knew how many people had died. They just felt like they had to talk to him. So they moved out. Tanjiro had a mansion of his own. After all, he had become the son Hashiro, so that he was given an allowance that was quite... A lot, and he was also given a mansion. His family had stayed at that mansion together with his father. They had moved from the area near Sekonjiro Kodaki and had gone to live at the mansion. There, he got greeted warmly by his mother, who hadn't seen him in a while. His father was also there and congratulated him. After all, he had heard the news from Ubiashiki himself that Tanjiro had taken down an upper moon demon, which was quite an impressive feat. Tanjiro enjoyed a meal with his family, playing with his younger brothers and younger sister, as he then proceeded to go back to training, his father joining him. His father had also made great progress. In terms of strength, he was at least on the level of a Hashira, and he could easily probably defeat a lower moon demon. There were still a few flaws in his technique, but he was ironing them out as they went. Tandra tried to teach him everything that he knew himself, but his father wasn't so much focused on training. After all, he still had a family to take care of. Tanjiro was just happy that he got to spend time with his dad. After all, what happened in the past and his dad dying to an unknown disease was saddening to him. He didn't want it to happen again, even though he knew that it probably would. At that moment, when they were sparring, a knock was heard. Tanjiro and his father stopped sparring as they went over to the massive gate that was leading to their mansion. Tantra opened it to see Kanai and her younger sister, Shinobu. Shinobu was quite bold when she spoke, and it made Tantra remember that she said something about her past, and that she was brought up in a rich family, so he thought she was acting a bit spoiled, though it made him laugh. Shinobu retracted her boldness, after realizing that she was maybe being a bit over the line and stepping over it. Though, Kanae also started laughing. They were allowed to enter as they got something to drink. A little bit of tea, herbal tea. In the specialty of Sekonji Rokodaki, they spoke with Tanjiro and consoled him a bit. 
he realized that he sh was a lot more emotional than what he was in the past, maybe due to his young age, but he didn't want to see many people dying like how he did in the past, and he was beating himself up over it. And they were basically telling him that he was doing a great job. After all, he had beaten an upper moon demon on his own, no less. And technically speaking, they were two upper moon demons, as it was both Daki and Gyutaro. They both congratulated Tanjiro before they headed out, saying that they would love to spar with him in the future as well, to increase their own strength. Stuff like that. Though Tanjiro just thanked them for stopping by, and wished them well. He continued to spar with his father, and so a few months passed. Tanjiro was given a sort of break. He was only sent out on missions if they knew that they were stronger demons, demons that people under Kinoe rank could not handle, and even if there were missions like that, they were usually given to the other Hashra first, so Tanjiro really only went out maybe four or five times, and thus a few months had actually passed. Eight in total. In this time, a new Hashra had joined the ranks, the sound Hashra Tengen Uzui. Tanjiro and him got really close right away. Tanjiro was really kind, and Tengen had heard a lot about Tanjiro from Ubiashiki and the other Hashra, saying how Tanjiro is currently the only one in the last 100 years to have beaten an upper moon demon, which Tengen was quite surprised about. Tanjiro also had this flair about him. He didn't quite show it, but he was really mature for his age. And he was also quite strong, so Tengen thought that Tanjiro was quite flashy indeed. A little bit of a Hashra meeting came to pass. Ubiashiki had called for all the Hashras to meet up because he wanted to inform them on some information, and he wanted to inform them right before the Hashra training would start. Everybody came to, and he started explaining things about the upper moons, stuff that he had heard from a source. Now, he didn't specify who the source was, but he wanted to inform the upper moons uh, about the upper moon's strength and weaknesses. After all, if the demon slayers ever ran into an upper moon, it would be better if they themselves were stronger than if they would lose. So, he started explaining about all of the weaknesses and strengths from the other demons demons that he knew of, like Akaza, Doma, uh, Kokoshibo, stuff like that. He didn't know much about Kokoshibo, but he knew stuff about Akaza, and he knew stuff about some of the lower-ranked uh, demons. The only two that really were quite still a mystery were both Kokoshibo and Doma, as Tanjiro had never really personally beaten them, or wasn't there when they were defeated. Muzan, on the other hand, he also informed them about that they had information that Muzan could not be beaten by decapitation, and that he could only be beaten by the sunlight. The demon slayers, the Hashra that were there, they were a bit panicked, but then Ubiashiki said that Tanjiro had explained that they just needed to be able to fight the entire night. They were not alone. If they defeated all the upper moons, then it would basically be them versus Muzan. And by the time that they could fight Muzan, there would probably be more Hashra. That's what Ubiashiki speculated. Further than that, there was no more information to be given. So the Hashra training started and every Hashra had their own segments. They would train with each other to make each other stronger, and Tanjiro also joined in on this, and his training was quite beneficial, as he not only helped them train just their basics, he would also help them train with their mark and stuff like that. And him training with the other Hashra when they themselves were still getting stronger also made him see the flaws that he himself had in the past, so he learned a lot. The others learning a lot too. Most of the demon slayers also picked up on how to actually get a demon slayer mark and how to get the crimson red sword. They grew immensely powerful really quickly, and that's about it. 
the Hashra training lasted for a little over a month, and the other Hashra just trained together. There wasn't much to do besides that. Tanjiro had a leisurely life whilst still training. He trained mostly with his father and the other Hashras, but the Hashra training was the only real thing that he had to worry about. Other than that, he didn't get given any new objectives by Ubiashiki, only being sent out a few times to take care of some weak demon. He was a bit bored, actually. He always had his friends to be there when they didn't have to do anything and would always train with them, but now he was just training with the other Hashra, and that wasn't a bad thing, he was getting a connection with them, but he felt the immense difference between his own strength and the others, and he had to usually hold back quite a bit to get the Hashra to his level, so he decided that training alone would maybe be better, and he did. He went out and started training on his own for the better part of a year. Tantra had left. His own training had started just momentarily. He wanted to train on his own and try and get stronger, maybe find new things on his own. After all, he had basically already mastered every technique. The only problem was now his own body and, well... That's it. He just had to grow. He just had to grow and mature that way his body could keep up with his strength. That was all that was holding back Tanjiro at this very moment. So he decided that he would work on his body, push his body to the utmost limits, and that's why he left. He gave a notice to Ubiashiki, who gave the notice to the other Hashra that Tanjiro would be leaving to go on training. He would still kill demons, but he would more so do it as a vigilante and on his own, from passing through towns. He went on a sort of adventure of his own. For the better part of a year, he would travel between villages and go from mountain to mountain, usually finding demons there and killing them pretty easily. Other than that, he would just train in certain areas, demon slayer facilities, and he would sometimes spar with people that he met. He met a few samurai on his way, and a few mercenaries as well, asking them to spar with him because maybe he could learn a thing or two from them. They would always comply because they saw that Tanjiro had a drive, he had... A sort of fire in him. They saw that he was always motivated to get stronger, and they also saw his attire and thought that he was pretty rich. Now, of course, Tanjiro does have a lot of money being backed up by the Demon Slayer Corps, which is one of the richest corporations in the entirety of Japan, but that didn't mean that he would just flounder about money. But he did have a nice katana, and people often mistook him for a very rich samurai even though he was young. He would usually spar with these people and quickly learn a thing or two from them, like footwork, stuff like that. He tried to always incorporate it a bit in his own techniques. Now, obviously, he knew that the Hinokami Kagura was definitely the way to beat Muzan, but what about other demons? Of course, sun-breathing was immensely powerful and it was very effective against most demons, but what if he fought against, for example, Upper Moon 1? He didn't know much about Upper Moon 1, after all, he didn't partake in the fight, but from the Crow's report, he did know that Upper Moon 1 was a swordsman much like himself, so maybe fighting other swordsmen would be handy to him. He left it be and just continued on his way, going through other villages where he fought more mercenaries, more samurai, found their techniques, their stuff. Eventually, he found a dojo, a martial arts dojo. He decided that maybe giving a quick peek inside would help a lot. After all, he remembered Akaza, who was a fer very formidable fighter, even though he was a demon. He knew that... Akaza must have been very strong as a human to be even able to get Muzan's attention and to become an upper moon. He must have definitely have become very strong as a human at least.
When entering the dojo, he got approached by an older man who asked him what a young boy like him was doing there. Tanjiro asked if he could maybe look at their techniques. After all, he was a swordsman who wanted to learn to be stronger. He had already learned hand-to-hand -hand combat from a Rokodaki, but maybe he could learn more, different styles, and incorporate them in his swordsmanship, maybe. The man decided that it would be fine and let Tanjiro look at some of their spars. It was at that moment that Tanjiro was very intrigued. The fighting looked a bit similar to Akaza's, but was different. Akaza has obviously transformed his original fighting style into a blood demon art, but Tanjiro did recognize some of the stances, so Tanjiro asked. He asked the man if he could learn a bit, if he could stay here for two or so months and maybe learn from the man. The man said that that was fine, but however, Tanjiro would have to pay an entrance fee, which he easily covered with the money he got from the Demon Slayer Corps. He took a few lessons and quickly learned a lot. Tanjiro grew exponentially, and even the master of the dojo said that Tanjiro basically mastered the entire fighting art, that he just had to make his, his own now, as he had already other conflicting martial arts within him. He learned the footwork, the stances, the ways their punches should be made, stuff like that. It made him think of how to incorporate this into his own swordsmanship, stuff like that. He continued on to his journey after those two months. It was about nine months now that he was gone and that he had been on his own. So he decided that he wanted a change of pace. He made his way back to Mount Sagiri, where Sekonjo Rokodaki stayed. He was going to train there for the time being. He wanted to. He discussed it with Orokodaki, and Orokodaki let him be. After all, he wasn't close to Tanjiro, but, well, Tanjiro had, had killed an upper moon demon, and he had a lot of respect for Tanjiro. And after all, Tanjiro was friends with his students, so why not? He let Tanjiro stay, which Tanjiro then proceeded to train on his own. He would push his body to the utmost limit, lifting rocks that were twice, maybe even three times the size of his body, just to gain physical strength. He would obviously use breathing, and sometimes he wouldn't use breathing just to switch on and off, just to see how far his actual own physical strength got. But that wasn't all. He would just train. That was all he did. Train in his precision, his swordsmanship, get it to the utmost perfection that he could. Even his breathing could still get better. He would focus on techniques. He would incorporate stuff that he learned from the people he had encountered on his journey. And he would incorporate that into his breathing style, stuff like that. He just tried to perfect himself, even though he had already, in quotation, the perfect breathing, he wanted to get stronger. He wanted more power so that he could protect the things he loved. The Tanjiro had talked to Ubiashiki. His final fight, he described to Ubiashiki, his final fight with Muzan before he died. He described the entire fight. He explained how he got a memory from his ancestor where it depicted this man with the same earrings as he had, the original Sunbreath user. Ubiashiki had brought out a lot of records, old records from the Demon Slayer Corps dating back easily 400 years, even before that time. And Tantra had taken a look at it. He knew his entire family record and he knew about that his ancestor was around 300 to 400 years old, or in the past, 300 to 400 years ago in the past. So he looked at mostly those records, eventually finding records about the first breathing styles, stuff like that, the first time they appeared. Other than that, before that time, the people just used their own swordsmanship techniques and they still were able to kill demons, although not as effectively. This did mean, though, that they had a strong base. They weren't just focusing only on breathing. The demon slayers from way back then 
focused also on their own swordsmanship without breathing and then afterwards incorporated breathing into that that is what tantra was trying to aim at he wanted to see if he could figure out a way to combine those two like they did in the past because obviously that was the golden age of the demon slayer core and if he could go back to that maybe have that same strength as the original sun breath user then maybe just maybe he could beat all the demons in the upper moon without having to get have anybody else get hurt that was tanjo's plan he wanted to get so strong that he could lead the demon slayers into combat and make sure they were fine Time passed quickly once more, and whilst he was trying to figure out the combat, almost five months had passed. Tandra was now absent from the Demon Slayer Corps for a year on the dot, and he didn't particularly want to go back that fast. He still wanted to get stronger. Ubiashiki had sent a letter to Tanjiro. There were now more Hashran. He had invited Tanjiro to come to a Hashra meeting so that they could greet him. But he had also put in the message that Tanjiro had six more months before he had to come back to the Demon Slayer Corps. Six months that he could take for training. Tanjiro was thinking who would be the Hashra, but decided that he would leave it. He wanted to get stronger first, and then he'd go back to the Demon Slayer Corps. So, he started training further, and very quickly six months passed. When Tantra descended the mountain, Orokodaki looked at him. They had formed a bond, quite a good bond, because Orokodaki would often go and look at Tantra's training, maybe incorporate it into his future disciples' training, because while well, Tantra was a Hashra, and he was currently the only one who had killed an upper moon. He saw that Tantra changed a lot. Tantra had gotten taller, first of all, and his muscles were more refined. He had truly pushed his body to the limit. Now the only thing he could do was keep training and let his body grow into it. He told Tanjiro that he shouldn't push himself too hard since he's still young, but Tanjiro said that in the fight against the demons, pushing oneself hard is the only thing they could do. He then proceeded to make his way back to Demon Slayer HQ, running along the entire way after saying his goodbyes to Rokodaki. It took him about a few days, three in total, to get there. He got greeted by some familiar faces, Kanae, Shinobu, Sabito, Tengen, Gyome, and even Shinjiro, who was about to retire from the, being a Hashira. Then he saw a few new faces, Giyu Tomioka, had become a Hashira. Now Tandro was perplexed since Giyu was a water hush, uh, was a water breath user, and so was Sabito. And then Ubiashiki went into a bit of explanation when he appeared. He explained how Giyu's water breathing is different from Sabito's. His is a lot more calm in terms of Sabito's and that they're more or less two opposite sides of a coin, and that way they could both be the Hashra for water breathing. Plus, it would be weird to have Giyu not be a Hashra since he's at the level of a Hashra. Since he had become a Kinoe over a year ago, his demon kill count had reached 126 which was already double over what it was supposed to be for him to become a Hashra. He was the latest, newest Hashira. Other than him, there was one other new Hashira. Kyojiro Rengoku. He was young, a year younger than Giyu Tomioka, who was 15, but he was still four years older than Tantro. 
he had a lot of energy and the reason he became a Hashra in the first place is because he had finished final selection a bit after Tanjiro had taught him after three months. He had learned so much from the little interactions he had with Tanjiro, and Tanjiro always sent letters to everybody. He would send letters when he was on his trip. It's not like they didn't hear from him. He especially sent a lot of letters to his family, but he would also send letters to Shinjiro and also Kyojiro, and he would send letters specifically to Kyojiro explaining techniques and things that he had learned and training methods that he himself used, and Kyojiro grew exponentially from that. He was already a massive talent considering that he had trained himself in the past and that even other Hashira found his certain training method way too hard. Being taught by someone who is at a level of defeating an upper moon like Tanjiro, even if it's just through letters, was a massive gain to the boy. Not only that, but Shinjiro, his father, would help him a lot. Unlike in Tanjiro's previous life, Shinjiro never really got mad. Yeah, it was tragic. His mother was now still ill and it didn't look well. But he kept his spirits up because he saw that all the others were doing that too. And he realized that he shouldn't be fussing over breathing styles. He taught Kyojuro a lot, and Kyojuro even managed to do the movements of the Hinokami Kagura. The breathing technique itself was way too hard, but he was able to copy the movements, at least for the first three forms. So, his talent really showed, and his persistence showed as well. His strength was immense. He had grown so much that he could now be compared to someone like Kanae, who had been a Hashira way longer. He could even easily be compared to his father. Not really, since his father had more experience, but in terms of technique, he had almost the same mastery over it. So, now all that was left was for him to gain experience, and they knew that. Kyodro had become a Hashira, and on his endeavors, he had beaten a Lower Moon Demon, a Lower Moon Demon that had used a gun. He was a Tsugoko at first, but since Shinjiro was already retiring, he got offered the position, and while well, him now having beaten a Lower Moon Demon brought him as the perfect replacement, so he got made the new Flame Hashira while Shinjiro was still in the process of retiring. Now, they didn't only call Tanjiro here to inform him about these two new Hashira, no, 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 that's not all that he was there for. They also wanted Tanjiro to partake in another Hashira training. He had been gone for a year and a half, so it, this was around the time when they wanted to do another Hashira training, and since Ubiashiki wanted to make this training two to three months long, obviously the Hashira would still partake in destroying demons, but they wanted to train newer recruits to bring them up to speed, because Ubiashiki saw that Tanjiro was already ahead of everybody, so it would be best if he dialed down a bit, not in terms of becoming weaker or staying the same strength, but simply to let others catch up so that he could still gain his exponential growth whenever he's sparring with them. Tanjiro agreed to this, and pretty soon they had another Hashira training uh, session, where they would train the Demon Slayers. Each Hashira f foresaw their own thing, but some Hashras teamed up, like Giyu and Sabito. They showed the difference between having a calm mind and attacking aggressive, since Sabito was a lot more aggressive in his fighting style, and Giyu was more someone who counterattacked or intercepted the enemy. It was really quite a handful to learn, but all of the slayers grew from it, and after two months, even the Hashra got a lot stronger. It was around this time that something 
very tragic happened. Kyojuro Rengoku's mother had passed away. The Hashras were all there to console them, and Shinjiro, even though very sad and heartbroken, took it better than what he did in his past life. He had found a camar camaraderie in his fellow Demon Slayer brothers, and they were able to help him stay afloat in this tragic time. Kyojuro was very sad, just as sad as his younger brother, but he gained strength from it. He gained this blaze in his heart, this saying that he had to get stronger. So he didn't let it get on his nerves too much. He kept training even harder than before now. He wanted to prove that this fight against the demons would be over and that nobody would have to lose someone like how he did. Even if how he lost her was not related to the demons, it could be seen that it was. Life went on for the demon slayers. Time passed incredibly fast. Tanjiro would keep slaying demons, and pretty quickly most of the lower moons that they had found were killed. The demon slayers were a lot stronger, to the point where Muzan had called for a meeting, both lower moons and upper moons alike. He would walk among the upper moons whilst the lower moons were forced to stay at a lower platform. He berated them, upper moons and lower moons, for being so weak to lose to a few humans. Definitely looking at the lower moons, more at the upper moons. He ordered Doma and Kokoshibo to take care of Tanjiro Kamado. He had remembered that via Gyutaro's memory, this boy who resembled Yuroichi Tsujikuni and used the exact same sun-breathing style as him, had shown up once again, and had started killing lower and upper moons, and he was scared. The upper moons knew he was scared, but they didn't even think it, they didn't, they just, it was a feeling, they wouldn't think it though because they were afraid for their lives. One of the lower moons did think it though, and got killed by Muson on the spot. He didn't kill the other lower moons as he thought that they made perfect sacrifices to buy him more time. Currently there wasn't really any need for their power, but he needed them to be father so he could stay alive longer. Meanwhile around this time Tanjo's 11th birthday came around. He hadn't done anything for his ninth or tenth, but the entire Demon Slayer core was there to party with him, because he was definitely their strongest slayer, and keeping him happy was important, but also because they were his good friends. That's all there was to it. They were his very close and good friends. They partied, and partied they did. It was all pretty much the entire night, some of the adults were drinking booze, whilst the others drank other things. And they had a barbecue, which was fun. After the party, Tanjiro got approached by Shinobu and Kanae. They had a joint mission that they were doing, Shinobu being Kanae's Tsugoko, and they had a joint mission of investigating an area and they had invited Tanjiro along, since they wanted to spend more time with him. Tanjiro was quite a kind guy, and they also wanted to learn more from him, wanting to get stronger, especially Shinobu. This was Shinobu's request, after all. So, after about a week of having just calmed down and having trained and stuff like that, Tanjiro got informed that they would be leaving. 
So they did. They left and made their way to a rural village quite far away. This village was definitely still old school, and there, whilst walking on a bridge, Tanjo and Kane were disgusted. They saw a child getting dragged along by an older man, this child being Kanao. Tanjo and Kanae went up to the man, who was saying something about selling the girl. Shinobu was telling them to knock it off since they shouldn't butt into other people's business, but Kanae and Tanjiro both looked at each other and they knew what they were about to do. Kanae threw money in the air saying something about that this was for the girl, and then Tanjiro took the girl and they started running. Shinobu was mad at them, but they didn't care. They released the girl from her chains, after which they tried to talk to her, but she was completely silent. Tanjiro said that they should take her back to the flower mansion, as he would take care of the demons lurking here. They asked him if he would be alright, and he told them not to worry. He sniffed around trying to find a demon, but he got stopped by the girl who grabbed his kimono. She just looked at him, didn't say anything, but she looked at him with eyes that told him that she wanted to be with him, around him. Tanjiro was the same age as the girl, he knew this girl, this was Kano, but he was different from what he was in the past. He was taller than he was before, and he was definitely a lot stronger, so he looked older. He picked her up and handed her to Kane, saying that he would come back, and that she should just stay with these people, and that they would keep her safe. The girl didn't say anything, but she didn't move, didn't say anything. Tanjiro quickly took care of business. He went around at night sniffing out the demons and eventually finding a demon that was killing innocent people and then eating them. He quickly took care of the demon without even having to put much effort into it and then made his way back to the flower mansion. He got there after a day of traveling and he arrived a bit after Kana and Shinobu had arrived, they were impressed by his speed, and he realized that they had to move slower since of the girl, and he apologized because he should have been able to carry her here faster. They didn't say anything and then just proceeded to move on. Kana would try and talk to the girl, and she was pretty much exactly like Tanjiro. Shinobu lightened up and took care of the kid whilst acting more like how she acted in Tanjiro's past life, being kind. They took care of the girl, and even Tanjiro and Kane asked her if she wanted to learn swordsmanship because she seemed very interested in it. So. They would teach her different things. Tanjiro tried and teach her the Hinokami Kagura, a bit of water breathing, a bit of everything he knew, and Kanae just strictly thought flower breathing. The girl was a bit overwhelmed at first, but she quickly just got used to it, and being with both Kanae and Tanjiro, she really lightened up fast. She got given a coin by Kanae, who had told her that if she ever had struggles with a decision, she should just flip it. Tanjiro let this be as he thought that Kanae would probably ease into being how she was after taking a while to get there again. He didn't want to push her. Though, he was quite surprised that she kept up with his movements. She was more designed for flower breathing, but she did learn a lot from Tanjiro as in his techniques that he had learned that weren't breathing styles. Sun breathing was out of her league, but she did learn the flowing from water breathing, stuff like that. And so a year quickly passed. 
Tanjiro was still hanging out at the flower mansion because, well, he went home, which was not that far away, would talk to his family and then came back. His family was safe, so he never had to worry, and he would visit them often whenever he had free time. His training came first, though. He wanted to get strong enough first to take care of Muson, and then he would go and just live a peaceful life after that, maybe back in the mountains. It was around this time that Tanjiro approached the Flower Mansion, where he got told by Kanae that she would be headed on a mission, a mission that looked to be very dangerous. Tanjiro asked her if she would be alright, and she said that she could handle herself, or that she would be fine, and that somebody would have to look after Kanae. However, Shinobu then came out. She was now a lot stronger, after all, Tanjiro had made a few suggestions to her, and she had become a Hashira in this time. Shinobu had become the butterfly Hashira. Tanjiro had told both Kane and Shinobu that Shinobu's build was not good enough for flower breathing, which had really made Shinobu angry at him. However, he then said that there might be other options for her, which led to him saying that she could become someone so fast that she could inject poison into the demons basically saying that she should focus on speed, precision, stuff like that, which Shinobu started doing under the training of Tanjiro. However, she still had to make her own breathing style in the end, which was based off of flower breathing, though he helped her with other things that he remembered from his past life, and he would even help her train, train her lower body, stuff like that. And she had become really strong really fast, because she could move very fast and she could inject poison into demons. It was also only just two weeks before he came to Kane and she had told him about the dangerous mission that a wind Hashira had appeared. Sonami. He was very arrogant and very rude, but when he saw the other... Hashira, he calmed down, especially Tantro. He knew about Tantro. Everybody in the Demon Slayer Corps knew about Tantro, and his friend, who was alive but very fatally wounded, was also a big fan of Tantro. He had even learned under him. When Sanami saw Tanjiro, he dialed down a lot, not insulting Ubiashiki any longer because Tanjiro had stood up for Ubiashiki. Ubiashiki even told Sonami that he wished the best for Masachika. After all, he didn't want him to die to the injuries he had received. But because of Shinobu getting a lot into pharmaceuticals and poison and stuff like that and experimenting with different things, she got pretty good into medicine. She wasn't anywhere near expert level, but she was good enough for a Kakushi's kind of treatment. So the flower mansion, which was now the flower and butterfly mansion, was now this place where people could go with injuries as well and be treated. So Masachika was currently also in the flower mansion. Sanami was also stronger, and he knew Tanjiro, and some of the other Hashira already, because he had partaken in a Hashira training before together with his friend. Though he hadn't trained with Tanjiro, he had seen Tanjiro, but Masachika did train with Tanjiro, and, well, that's about that. Back to the present, Tanjiro was worried for Kanae. Shinobu told him that he could go with her if he truly has a bad feeling, and that she could stay with Kano. Now, Tanjiro didn't only just now have a bad feeling, he knew that around this time, Shinobu's sister had died, so he was thinking that maybe this was the mission. Tanjiro decided to catch up to her. With his immense speed, it only took him 30 minutes to do so, as he arrived next to Kane. He said he would be joining her on this mission. Kanae 
spoke to Tanjiro and said that it really wasn't necessary, though he said that he had a bad feeling, so she decided to just leave it be. He followed her all the way to the village. They had talked along the way, and these two really got together really well. They were almost the exact same being, in a sense, but also not. They arrived and they waited for night to fall, finding information in the daytime. At night, they would look for the demon and eventually find it, though Tanjiro took a sigh. This was not the Upper Moon 2 demon Doma, and so she was safe. She got into a fight with the demon and took care of it rather easily and quickly. She then turned to Tanjiro and asked if they should leave, though at that moment in time, a voice could be heard. Both Tanjiro and Kanae turned around to look, and there stood a blonde man with the number two engraved on his eye. Tanjiro instantly knew this was the Upper Moon Demon Doma as he got into a battle stance drawing his sword. Kanae did the same following his lead. Doma made some slight banter. He didn't instantly start fighting, he made fun of them first. He laughed. He laughed at Tanjiro. He questioned to himself why Master Muzan was scared of a kid that was only 12 years old. But in an instant, he got slashed. He could follow the movements of Tanjiro, but Tanjiro had moved so fast. And with the Hinokamikagura's first form, Dance, he had slashed Doma right then and there, his chest spewing out blood. He stepped back, he jumped back, and he just looked at his chest. It quickly regenerated, but he took the fight more serious as he got his fans out and started using his blood demon art. The entire area turned misty, as if ice was forming. It was cold. Tanjiro yelled out to Kanae that she shouldn't breathe in the cold air, as it would freeze her lungs. He had remembered this from the report of a crow when he had gone into the Infinity Castle in his past life. Kanae did exactly that, she didn't try to breathe in the cold air. Doma was surprised that Tanjiro knew, but it didn't hinder anything. He started making clones, small versions of himself from ice that could copy his movements and that were just as strong as him. Well, not really, but close enough. They started holding back Kanae whilst he was fighting Tanjiro. He said he would kill Tanjiro, and then he would feast on Kane. Though Tanjiro knew that daybreak was not far away, and he could probably beat Doma, but he had to be worried about Kane as well. He didn't want her to get hurt. He had gotten really close to her, after all. Tanjiro jumped up. It was a dangerous move to do, but everywhere was cold. He jumped on top of a roof. He took a breath after he finally could. And then he prepared to go all out. First of all, he went down and destroyed the ice clone of Doma, which freed Kanae. Kanae was a lot stronger now, and she could probably go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Doma for a short while, so having her as backup would probably help a lot. They both started going towards Doma at a high speed. The next instance, Doma used his Buddha, his ice Buddha. He didn't want to choke around anymore as he saw that Tanjiro was stronger than he thought, and now he realized why Muzan was scared of Tanjiro. When Tanjiro rushed at Doma, his cells were boiling, and he saw an image of a man, Yoroichi Tsujikuni. He didn't want to experience the fear that Master Muzan had felt, so he decided to fight. To his fullest, 
Usually he'd joke around a bit, and he would never really fight to his fullest, but now something was telling him that he should. It was Master Muzon. He was spectating the fight through Doma's vision, and he did not like what he saw. He didn't like that Doma was joking around. He had prepared to send Kokoshibo there. He himself didn't want to go because he was scared of facing Tanjiro. If Tanjiro really mastered sun breathing, then he could stop him. Plus, daybreak was around the corner. Tanjiro and Kane were busting out moves, forms of their respective breathing styles constantly. They attacked the Buddha and Doma, but they couldn't get any clear hits. Every hit was too shallow or didn't leave anything that could, or Doma would just instantly regenerate. Tanjiro was still young, and his body wasn't as developed. After all, he hadn't even gone through puberty yet, he was only just 12 years old. The real problem was that his lungs were small, and although his breathing was near perfect, he couldn't hold his breath as long as some of the other slayers. Even Kanae could hold her breath longer than Tanjiro, so she was fine in this cold mist. Though Tanjiro was starting to gasp, he breathed in. Kanae was afraid because she realized Tanjiro had gotten the cold air into his lungs and his lungs would start to freeze. Tanjiro coughed up blood, though it didn't matter. In that moment, he exerted as much strength as he could. His blade sparked. It was more red than before. His mark looked like it was glowing, and he slashed upwards at the Buddha, slicing it clean in two. The air pressure alone pushed away all the cold mist, as he was finally able to breathe again. Doma was surprised that Tanjiro had released this much strength, and he tried to summon the mist right away again, the cold, icy mist. Though in that instance, Kanae followed up, attacking Doma as she took a new breath. Her slash cut off one of his arms. He was about to penetrate her chest as he wanted to kill her and then just devour her right after killing Tanjiro. However, Tanjiro used the fake rainbow from his Hinokami Kagura and got behind Doma. Doma was surprised because he thought there were two of Tanjiro, but that was just the mirage that he left behind. And then in a circular motion, a horizontal version of the fire wheel attack, he cut off Doma's head. Doma's head flew, and flew to the ground. He thought to himself, maybe, just maybe, he could regenerate his head, just like how Master Muzon had. But no. His throat, he could still feel this burning sensation. It's at that point he realized why Master Muzon feared Tanjiro so much. It's because Tanjiro could slow a demon's regeneration. His crimson red blade hurt so much, and Doma had already experienced the crimson red blade in the past. He slowly started disintegrating, and he got angry. He didn't know what love truly was, and his emotions he never truly experienced, but at this point, point in time he knew what true fear was. He feared death. In the past, when Doma had been killed, he thought he found love in Shinobu, but this time he found fear. It excited him. He wanted to feel this again, but he had already disintegrated and he had made his way down to hell. Kanae, who was lightly injured because of the freezing air, had still hurt her skin. She was fine, but she cheered. She was so happy. She looked over at Tanjiro, but Tanjiro laid on the ground, passed out. She worried and quickly ran over to Tanjiro, who 
had blood coming out of his mouth. His lungs had frozen and he needed treatment right now if he would want to be saved. Daybreak was coming, and at that point in time, a voice could be heard. It was Shinobu. Tantro had sent out a crow a bit earlier when he sought Doma. When he got into his battle stance, he instantly signaled at his crow for reinforcements. Shinobu came and took a look at Tanjiro. She was worried about him, and quickly they carried Tanjiro over to the Butterfly Mansion. Four months passed. After four months, Tanjiro woke up. His body didn't hurt, but his lungs, he could feel it, they hurt a lot. Right next to him sat a girl, a girl he recognized, Kanao. She looked at him and she spoke. She was glad that he was back. She cried and hugged him. Tanjiro was surprised. She had never really shown her feelings this much, but when he and Kanae returned, she wanted to get stronger because she was afraid that Tanjiro would not make it back. Him being one of the people that saved her, she liked him a lot. Kanae had taken Kanao under her wing, and, well, Kanao had opened up a lot. Kanae's open personality and her fun-going, goofy-type personality got Kanao to think and speak off her own. She didn't need the coin anymore. It was a development that Tanjiro had not thought she would make so fast. Kano quickly went away and told Tanjiro that he needed to rest. So Tanjiro just laid down. After about ten minutes, Shinobu and Kanae rushed into the room. Shinobu did a quick checkup on Tanjiro whilst Kanae was fussing and worrying about him, asking how he felt and if he was okay. Tanjiro said he felt fine, but that his lungs hurt a bit. Shinobu started explaining that his lungs were frozen and that they got damaged a bit, but that they should recuperate if he just takes his medicine and stuff like that. Tanjiro didn't question anything, but he was going to be bedridden for two more months. Whilst he was bedridden before, in the four months' time that he had been passed out, a Hashra meeting had taken place. Ubiashiki knew where Muzan was going to appear. This was information that Tanjiro had passed on to him before. It was the exact date, the exact day that Muzan would appear in their old house in the mountains. Ubiashiki had planned to set up an ambush. It was only eight months away. Eight more months, and then, and then they would finally be able to fight Muzan. But now that their strongest slayer was bedridden, they knew that they had to get stronger. So Ubiashiki ordered that the slayers would all train for the coming year. Tantro got all this information from Kanae and Shinobu. He thought to himself and thought about it. If they could ambush, ambush Muzan and they could get him to stay until daybreak, then they could win. But here was the thing. They'd have to fight someone stronger than Doma and fight him for the entire night. Even worse was if Muzan truly wanted, he could summon the other upper moon that are still there. Tanjiro was worried, so he decided that he would have to stay in bed, rest up, and then join the training effort as quickly as possible. After all, when he would join the training effort, there would only be six months left, give or take. So, two months passed by in a flash. However, Tantra didn't just sit still. He would be carried around by some people, and then he would sit and watch the training of certain people, especially the Hashra. 
He would make remarks and things that people could do better. Which was fine. Nobody really minded since Tantra was the strongest Hashira after all. The two months that he was in bad shape, he was able to make some people grow really strong, especially Kyojuro Rengoku, who took really well to Tanjo's advice. Some of the other Hashira also became stronger, like Gyome Himejima. He had grown a lot more physically and also mentally, to the point where he even accessed the see-through world. Tanjiro had been training the other Hashira to use the see-through world and the Demon Slayer Mark and other abilities, but some were a bit more difficult to pick up. Almost all the Hashira, however, could use the Crimson Blade, and they had even thought up of ways to activate it without having to put the strength of a vice in the blade, simply by clashing their blades and then turning them red through the heat of the friction. After those two months, Tanjiro joined the training. He quickly picked up the pace. He was growing and also becoming stronger, physically and, well, both mentally as well. He trained with all the Hashras, and they all got stronger. There wasn't really anything else to it. They just did the training that they did before, but to new extreme heights. They even sometimes fought together throughout the entire night, just so that they could prepare for the fight with Muzan. And so, six months quickly passed, the Demon Slayer core being a lot stronger than before. Currently, there were quite a few Hashira, and they had even called Shinjiro and Rokodaki back to the field. They would ambush Muzan with... Well, all of the Hashras and their Tsugoko and the stronger slayers. They all prepared and went to Tanjiro's old home. There Tanjiro sat. His father was there too. His father being able to use the Hinokami Kagura and also being very strong from himself. He had already climbed up to Kinoe and could become a Hashra, but he declined the position. He had other matters to attend to, after all, and that was mainly protecting Tanjiro's family. Though having two Sun Breath users here would be quite beneficial to, well, everyone. All the Hashra sat, they talked, they chatted cheerfully. Night fell, and, well, they continued talking. Cheerfully. Somewhere throughout the night, the door slid open. There stood a man in white clothing with a white fedora on his head. He took a look at the room and instantly realized that this was not just a family. These were demon slayers. In an instant, Tanjiro rushed forward and slashed at the man, his blade barely grazing the skin of the man who had jumped back. This was Kibutsuji Muzan and he instantly prepared to fight. All the Hashras jumped up, got outside, and they all took their battle positions, all preparing to fight Tanjiro. Tanjiro had explained their tactics and how Muzan fought. Now, they didn't know how Tanjiro knew this. Only a few of the Hashra knew Tanjiro's secrets, but they went along with it. Maybe Tanjiro had received the memories of his past life. As a slayer who had fought against Muzan, that's what some of the demon slayers had theorized, but of course, Tanjiro had just gotten the memories of this life, just the one that he had already lived. This was his second chance. All of the slayers busted out their moves, did their breathing styles, did their moves, deflected Muzan's attacks. Muzan couldn't escape because every time he tried to summon his portal or tell the Biwa demon to summon it, they would push him out of it. Even when the doors opened, they would attack the doors, breaking them, which would stop the link to the Infinity Castle. This way, none of the demons could come to Muzan's aid. 
Muzan felt backed into a corner and started unleashing more and more of his strength, even when Tandra and his father teamed up and using his full power, his crimson red blade, his father's crimson red blade, both their marks flaring up and attacking Muzan. They attacked the scars on his body. Tandro could already see them, and he knew exactly where to attack, and his father also already saw them because of their see-through world. They knew where to attack perfectly, and they tried attacking all of Muzan's scars because they knew those would burn the most. Tandro knew from the past. They attacked and attacked, the other slayers coming in with their own crimson red blades and their own moves, but Muzan kept deflecting most of the attacks. The only real people that were hitting him were one Kyojuro, Tantro himself, his father, and, well, Gyome. The other slayers were not able to keep up with Muzan's speed and were mostly there to deflect attacks that were heading to other slayers. Everybody was getting exhausted, and they still had to fight six hours before daybreak. Tandro even came very close to slicing off Muzan's head, but that wouldn't do anything, since Muzan could grow it back anyway. Tandro fought and fought an hour passed. Some of the slayers had passed out simply from exhaustion. Yeah, they trained and they fought each other all night, but... That was at an intensity way lower than this. This intensity that they were doing now was way beyond what they imagined. And some of the weaker slayers just couldn't keep up. Even some of the weaker Hashras were starting to, well, pass out or even lose concentration. Though Muzan wasn't in the best condition either. Shinobu Kocho had landed three hits on Muzan, and though he thought of her as weak, her blade held poison, wisteria, and some others, and she had injected him with three different poisons, all three of which he hadn't ever had to fight against, and they were starting to get to him. This led to Tandro and his father being able to hit more, and Muzan started really being frustrated. He attacked more wildly, more irrationally. He just attacked randomly at some points even. And at one point, an attack almost hit Tandro, though he had barely dodged it. Tandro decided to fight harder at the cost of more of his stamina. Three more hours until daybreak. They were so close. Three more hours. Just three hours. None of the other demons had showed up yet. Not even Kokoshibo. All they had to do was hold on for three hours, and then the king of all demons would perish, and then they could fight the other demons and finally exterminate them all from this earth. Tandro took a breath, but his legs gave out. He f almost fell over right into Muzan's attack as he was about to get pierced. However, he got pushed out of the way. He landed against a tree. His vision was blurry. He... Fought so hard he had forgotten to breathe the same exact mistake he had made against Daki the first time they had ever fought when he had held his breath and time almost slowed down like. And then he forgot to breathe, which led him to gasp for air. That exact same mistake, he did it again. He berated himself, but when he looked over, he was met by a horror. Shinjiro Rengoku was pierced by Muzan's attack straight through his chest. He coughed up blood as he looked at Tanjiro and said, 
fight. Finish this fight. His last attack was throwing his crimson red blade with all his remaining strength at Muzan, piercing Muzan's heart before Muzan retracted his tentacle-like arm, revealing a massive hole in Shinjiro's chest as Shinjiro fell backwards on his back. Tanjiro's memories resurfaced. The memory of Kyojuro Rengoku being pierced through the chest by Akaza, the number three upper moon. He fell into a rage. He let someone die again. The entire point that he was trying to do with his new second chance, this new life that he had repeated, was to minimalize all the casualties they had felt. Tears started to swell up with this rage as he rushed at Muzan, attacking constantly, relentlessly, slashing at every part of Muzan's body. Muzan was terrified. So very, very terrified. But he couldn't do anything against Tanjiro. Tanjiro was currently fighting Muzan alone, as the others all took this chance to take a break. Since Tanjiro was fighting Muzan perfectly, slashing off his arms, everything. Just two and a half more hours. Though Tanjiro got distracted, he heard a cry. Uh, father. He looked over, and for a split second, he caught the sight of a younger Kyojuro Rengoku crying at his father, who was dying, who was on his last breath, who head patted the young Kyojuro and told him to live on, not even being able to finish that sentence. Tanjiro slipped, missed Muzan by a hair. In that instance, a door opened. Tanjiro tried slashing again, but once again, his legs gave out, not because he forgot to take a breath, not because he had been weakened, but simply because he was exhausted. He was only 13 years old. His body couldn't handle this intense amount of sparring, of fighting even. He fell over. Muzan attacked Tanjiro, but it got deflected by his father, who tried slashing Muzan, but Muzan had already gone through the gate. Two hours and thirteen minutes. Two hours and thirteen minutes. Tanjiro repeated twice. Everybody was still. They couldn't say anything. They couldn't berate Tanjiro. They couldn't be mad. He had fought to his fullest. He was only thirteen years old. Nobody could berate anybody. They were all sad. They were all crying for Shinjiro's death. Two minutes. If I had just been able to hold out for two more minutes. A voice rang out from behind. It was Giyu. He sat on his knees and he was hating himself berating himself. Sabito put his hand on his back. Tanjiro cried. His cries made the others cry harder, and everybody was sad. They couldn't berate anybody because they themselves couldn't fight anymore. They had to take a break, and they had to hope that Tanjiro could hold out, but... They put so much pressure on just a 13-year-old boy. Yeah, he was the strongest amongst them, but he was still a child. Gyomei berated himself as well. 
he had gotten so much stronger, but even he had to take a break whilst fighting Muson. Two hours and thirteen minutes, Tanjiro said again, smashing the ground. If he had just held out thirteen more minutes, then the other Hashra could have perfectly been recuperated. They could have perfectly come back and assisted him, and then he didn't have to fight so hard. He cried and he cried. But why? Because he was weak? No. Actually, yeah. That was it. He was weak. The Demon Slayer Core. They had fought Muzan just recently. It had been a week since the incident. The entire Demon Slayer Corps was down. They had lost an ex-Hashra, a retired Hashra who had still volunteered to fight Muzan. Everybody was sad, but two people were the saddest. In a sense, Kyojuro Rengoku and Tanjiro Kamado, both of them were so sad about the passing of Shinjiro. Not only was Kyojuro now alone with his brother after having lost both parents, Tanjiro was berating himself over it. He was so weak that he hadn't been able to dodge the attack and thus Shinjiro had to sacrifice himself for Tanjiro's sake. It made him sad. They cried and the entire Hashra team, the entire Demon Slayer Corps, had tried to comfort each other. It took over a month for the shock of losing Shinjiro to settle in. Tanjiro in this time had trained himself more and more to the point where he was hurting his body, he was overdoing it. Some of the Hashra tried to talk to him but he could not stop. He was angry at himself to the point where he was breaking down. This was his second time living this life, and he had promised himself he would never lose someone dear to him again, and this time he had grown so close to Shinjiro Rengoku that they were like pal's best friends. They trained together, they had shed tears, blood, and sweat together, and yet, Tanjiro had to be saved by him. Tanjiro, the so-called strongest demon slayer, had to be saved. It made him sick. He wanted to become stronger as fast as possible. He wanted revenge. He hated Muzan even more now for taking another person dear away from him. But more than Muzan, he hated himself even more. This trait, which was so unlike Tanjiro, just kept boiling up inside of him. It kept eating away at his soul. He was training again. He was tossing around rocks making his physical body creak and ache. This large boulder, he was lifting it constantly, training past his limit, till he heard a voice. That's enough, Tanjiro. Please, stop. He looked over, and there he saw Kyojiro Rengoku, he was tearing up, but not because he was still sad about his father. No, he had already dealt with that pain like two weeks ago. 
He had set his heart ablaze and he himself had also started training, but he had heard that Tanjiro was breaking down, that he was pushing himself because he thought of himself as weak and he didn't want that for his friend. He didn't want that for his mentor. He didn't want that for the person he looked up to. Tanjiro stopped training and looked at Kyodro, and in an instant he started to cry. He couldn't hold back his tears, it was too much. Kyodro ran up to Tanjiro, and in an instant just wrapped his arms around him. This warm embrace that made Tanjiro break down in tears. They sat there for an hour, crying in each other's hands, and then after that they started talking. They talked about everything, about training, about life, about how Tanjiro's father was sick. Heck, Tanjiro had revealed his secret that he had already lived this life, and it didn't surprise Kyojuro. In fact, Kyodro told him that that was fine, and that he accepted it. They talked about Shinjiro, both of Tanjiro's past life and this current one. They talked about love interests, funny enough. They talked and talked and talked, and soon hours passed. Night was falling upon them, and it's at that point that Tanjiro realized what he had to do. A few weeks passed, and so another month, and so two months, and so three months. Tanjiro was unheard of. They didn't know where he went, and even his crow didn't know, which was very unlikely. Usually a crow would always follow a slayer. One day, whilst a Hashra meeting was taking place, almost another month after that, four months after his disappearance, Tanjiro appeared out of nowhere. His presence was powerful, stronger than before. Tanjiro had decided to go back to his roots. If he wasn't strong enough right now, he just had to repeat everything he had learned, make his bases even stronger, and build on top of that foundation, build himself a castle with a strong defense, and an even stronger offense. He wasn't going to lose anybody again. He wasn't going to make people suffer. Ubiashiki's face lit up. He felt Tanjiro's presence, and with the little bit remaining eyesight he had, saw Tanjiro's face full of determination, not the despairing face he had showed after, well... Shinjiro's death. Some of the Hashra that were there, they all smiled. Kyojiro's smile was massive. He welcomed Tanjiro back. There were some new faces there, though not for Tanjiro. He recognized all of them. Mitsuri, Obanai, they had joined the Demon Slayer Corps again. And surprisingly, Muichiro was there as well. Though, he looked a bit different. Younger, obviously. But he was there as a trainee, not as a Hashira. Tanjiro told them that he was back. And that he would kill Muzan. The rest of the Hashra meeting turned into one big welcome back to Tanjiro. Ubiashiki had ordered some of the people to go get food for them, as they all just enjoyed a nice picnic right there. They talked and talked and talked, and night fell upon them once more. They, par they partied. For no real reason, they partied. And so... Time flew by. 
months passed with the Demon Slayer core getting stronger and stronger, them hunting down demons with this new invigorated strength. They didn't know why, but Tanjiro's reappearance just made them all feel reassured. His new strong presence made them feel at ease, but that didn't mean they would slack off. They all doubled their training. Heck, the training Kyodro did in Tanjiro's past life was nothing compared to what these demon slayers were going through. Even Tanjiro himself was doing even more aggressive training than he had done when he was despairing, but all in the confines of his body. If one would have to use a word to describe him, superhuman would fit the bill perfectly. They trained together, they trained alone, they trained even whilst hunting demons. Heck, they used demons to train. Not in the sense that they would capture demons and train them like that, no, actively whilst they hunted them, they would try and dodge attacks, figure out blood demon arts, they did a lot more research. They, It was like an entire new Demon Slayer core had sprouted out of nowhere. It's like they were back in the Golden Age. More Demon Slayers were getting stronger, and a lot more Kinoe-ranked Slayers were showing up. This was amazing news for the Demon Slayer core, but Muzan was still terrified. He knew what the Demon Slayers were now capable of, and he was seriously considering staying hidden for another hundred years, at least until Tanjiro and his father were gone. But he was scared that they would leave children. If he wanted to be safe and sound, he had to get rid of Tanjiro. And the best way to do that would to be ambush Tanjiro. If he could fight Tanjiro together with Koko Shibo, even without, maybe he could defeat Tanjiro. But he had to at least bring Koko Shibo for that plan to work, because he remembered that rage, that power that Tanjiro showed, and it shook him to his core, even more than when Yoruichi did it. Another year passed by quickly. In this time, the Demon Slayer Corps had grown so powerful that some of the other Hashira had already killed the former Upper Moon 5 and 4. Obviously, those demons were now ranked Upper Moon 3 and 4, since, well, Doma was not there, so that meant that Akaza, who was Upper Moon 3, became Upper Moon 2. Furthermore, the Upper Moon 4 and 5 demon then became Upper Moon 3 and 4. Muzan was panicking, and for good reason. He now only had 3 Upper Moon, that being Koko Shibo, Akaza, and the Biwa demon. And the Lower Moons were no threat to the Demon Slayers at all. It made him even start a meeting with the Lower Moons, berating them, though he didn't kill them. They would make sufficient decoys for his plants to continue to work. Quickly, another year passed, and the Demon Slayer Corps had grown so powerful because of, well, Tanjiro's training and the other people, that slowly they were killing more demons than Muzan could make demons. It was this terrifying idea that really sent Muzan's cells to go insane in every demon that came across a demon slayer. Not only Tanjiro, but some of the other Hashira were now real monsters. To the point that Muzan wasn't just afraid of a Breath of the Sun user anymore. He questioned why they had gotten this strong... And then he thought to himself, what if he just stormed the Demon Slayer core with as many powerful demons as he could at the same time? Even if they were abominations or if they weren't complete demons yet, if he could 
overwhelm them. Then he stood a fighting chance. So he took six more months. And in these six months, he made as many demons as he could, but he kept them hidden in the Infinity Castle. Meanwhile, whilst he was doing this, he had told the Biwa demon to try and find the Demon Slayer core. Ubeyashiki had seen this. He had a sort of future sight moment. He told Tanjiro and they discussed what they would do. The other Hashra showed up and, well, Tantra was now 16. All of the Hashras from the previous life were here, and they were much stronger than in the past. Heck, there were new Hashras as well. He had taken in Zenitsu and Inosuke, and he had trained them, to the point where they were now Hashra level as well, though they hadn't proved themselves quite yet. Even Kanao was way stronger than in the past, Kanae was here as well, and it's just, he was happy. There were so many Hashra, to the point where he felt confident that even if Muzan came with Koko Shibo and more Upper Moon Demons, that they could take them head on. They decided that they would wait for Muzan's attack, and after a month... Day of Reckoning was here. Night fell, and whilst Ubiashiki was enjoying some tea, demons came to the Ubiashiki mansion. Muzan arrived with Koko Shibo and Akaza. The Biwa demon was still in the Infinity Castle since they were planning on at least taking Tanjiro there, and then overwhelming Tanjiro, because after Tanjiro, Muzan felt confident he could take care of all of the other Demon Slayers. The battle started. Hashra showed up, and instantly started attacking Muzan. When Kyojuro showed up, this... Rage boiled up inside him, but instead of letting it take control over him, he decided to harness that power. He set his heart ablaze as he attacked Muzan with this ferocious power, cutting off his arms to the surprise of the king of all demons. Some of the other Slayers arrived and all started attacking Muzan, and Muzan was questioning where Tanjiro was because Tanjiro wasn't here. It's at that point in time that he realized this was all a trap. He got poisoned because, well, Shinobu's speed was so fast that even he had problems keeping up with it, and not only that, but Zenitsu was there as well and Zenitsu's blade was coated in multiple poisons. It's then that he realized this wasn't just poison made by humans. This was poison made by somebody who knew demon physiology. Tamayo, he thought in his head as he got angry, his attacks once again being wild but still precise. He hit a few demon slayers and they got gravely injured, but still the Hashra were there to suppress him. Though, because of Kokoshibo, they had a hard time. His attacks were devastating and they had a wide area of effect, so it was harder to fight against that, though Sanami and Gyome were holding him back pretty well. He was surprised. He thought to himself, maybe if he was born in this era, he could have become stronger. But that didn't matter now, he would just kill them and then get it over with. Muzan was getting angrier and angrier. His power increased, but also he weakened. He was starting to change physically. His hair started to become gray. It's then that he realized that there was an aging drug as well that got injected into him. Lady Tamio hadn't sacrificed herself like an 
the past life of Tanjiro, but instead she had created this very dense poison that was easily able to be injected into Muzan with Shinobu's blade. Heck, Shinobu herself had created five different poisons to use against Muzan, and Lady Tamio had added three more. They had double the amount of different poisons that they used against Muzan, and then there was Sinitsu as well, who just used this very dense wisteria poison. This plan was a zero-sacrifice plan that Ubiashiki and Tanjiro had come up with. They would use all of the Demon Slayer's strongest aspects to defeat Muzan and, well, the other demons. Muzan released a scream, a thunderous attack which paralyzed the Demon Slayers for a moment, and then he and Kokoshibo opened the Infinity Castle doors. They entered, but at that moment, Muzan realized he messed up. The Demon Slayer started entering the portal after him, and also another person entered. Tanjiro. He and his father were waiting, because they knew that if they attacked Muzan now, he would probably retreat, and then it would all be for nothing. But if they infiltrated the Infinity Castle, then they could chase and hunt after Muzan. All of the Hashra entered, but only some of the Tsugoko and some of the Kinoe ranked slayers could enter after them. Here they had to fight countless demons, abominations that were ranked Lower Moon and Upper Moon even. Though most of the slayers were able to take them down, the overwhelming numbers started to overtake them. The Hashras were fine, but they had to preserve their strength, so the Kinoe ranked slayers and the Tsugoko were all telling them to just move on. Some of the Hashras stayed back to help out, and, well, their priorities were now Kokoshibo, Akaza, Muzan, and the, Bu and the Biwa demon. If they got them, everything would be sorted out. They made their way through the Infinity Castle, and Tanjiro and his father came across the Biwa demon. Tanjiro realized that most of her attacks were just to disorient them, or to send buildings crashing into them, so he decided he would finish this fight fast. Combining a bit of Zenitsu's leg techniques with his own, he quickly beheaded her with relative ease. This was just how strong he had gotten from creating his own base. He had trained intensely for the last three years just for this moment, just to take down Muzan. His training increased every day and only became more and more difficult. Superhuman was no longer a right term to describe Tanjiro Kamado. In the words of the villain himself, Muzan Kibutsuji, Tanjiro was right now a real monster. They continued their chase trying to find Muzan. Tanjiro tried to use his scent and his transparent world, but since Muzan's scent was all over the Infinity Castle, it was a bit difficult to track him down. Meanwhile, the other Hashra were all fighting their own battles. Sanami was currently fighting Kokoshibo alone, whilst Gyome had just finished Akaza. The other Hashra were all stuck with overwhelming numbers of these upper moons that were made hastily by Muzan. There were a few upper moon sixes there, or at least demons on the level of upper moon six, not specifically branded upper moon six, but since there were countless hundreds of them, it was hard for them to fight, since most of these demons were abominations that just through random attacks and were hard to predict since they just attacked randomly. Though most of the Hashra were fine, it was still a fight that was annoying and more time-consuming. 
The first people that arrived at Muzan were actually Mitsuri and Obanai, who started fighting the king of all demons. They had grown immensely since they had received a lot of help from the other slayers to catch up to that level, but it was still a difficult fight to do with just the two of them. They mostly blocked and deflected the attacks. Meanwhile, Gyome was making his way to where Upper Moon 1 was. And when he arrived, not only did he arrive, but also Tanjiro and his father arrived. Kokoshibo got angry because Tanjiro and his father both reminded him of, well, his younger brother, Yoroichi. He had always thought that he was destined for greatness, and then when his brother had always surpassed him in fighting, but then chose to not fight, it was enraging. And then when he had created sun breathing, the strongest breathing style, meanwhile his older brother couldn't even learn it, it was even more enraging. And just seeing that now, his breathing style, his younger brother's breathing style had lived on in not only one person, but two people, whilst his has died out, it was so enraging that he lost it. In a second he grew a horn and blades started sprouting from his body as his attacks started devastating the area around him, though the demon slayers deflected them easily. Kokoshibo wasn't at a level where he was a threat to these demon slayers anymore. Tanjiro had elevated all of the demon slayers so much because of his past knowledge and the level that he was already at where he could fight toe to toe with Muzan in the past, he had already surpassed his past self. And most of the demon slayers of this generation had also surpassed that Tanjiro. Most of the slayers were now on the level of the Golden Age Slayers, they were on the level of Koko Shibo and Yoroichi at their prime. They were no longer Slayers that could just be brushed over. And it's that mistake that Koko Shibo and Muzan made. They thought that sheer numbers would win, but no. They lacked strength. Koko Shibo got beheaded and, well, just like in the past, he regrew his head. But then, he remembered. He remembered his dream of becoming the strongest samurai. But when he saw his reflection in Tanjiro's blade, his crimson red blade, which reminded him so much of his brother's, he realized that he was just turning into a monster. He already thought of Tanjiro as a monster, but he himself was a real monster. He cried, which stopped Tanjiro from beheading him again. He told Tanjiro that he was sorry seeing his younger brother's reflection in him. He kept repeating it, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Yoroichi, as he started disintegrating. And so the Upper Moon One Demon, Koko Shibo, one of the very first demons, if not the first demon, to become an upper moon, had disintegrated. Tanjiro looked around, and the Hashras that were there, Gyome, Sanami, Muichiro, and then his father, they were completely unharmed. It made him think of the past when he heard Muichiro died and he heard about Sanami and Gyome's injuries. He thought to himself they had come so far, but were they truly still human? He remembered the last moments of his own life, the moments where he had become the Demon King. He knew for a fact that he was currently stronger that, than that demon king version of himself, but it made him wonder if one man could truly hold so much power and if it's okay. He quickly shook his head and cast away any doubt. 
He would not be shackled by his own restrictive thoughts. He would not be shackled by weakness. He had one goal, and after he defeated that goal, he could live a peaceful life with his family, with his father, with the people he loved, with his friends, with Kanae, Kanao, and Shinobu, with Mitsuri, with Obanai, with Muichiro, with Gyomei, with Sanami, with Tengen, with Kyojuro, with all of these demon slayers that he called his brothers, even Murata. He could finally be at peace, and all that was standing in his way was the King of Demons. He would not let weakness shackle his mind. He set his heart ablaze, as he, his father, Gyome Sanami, the other Hashra who had taken care of the weak upper moon abominations that Muzan had made, all made their way to where Kibutsuji Muzan was currently hiding. They surrounded him, and they knew, because they saw him. Even if he was surrounded by a flesh cocoon, with the transparent world, they looked straight at him. And he was trembling, and they all knew it. They were confident. They would not lose again. Tanjiro would not let someone die again. He would not make the same mistake that he had made three years ago. He would avenge his family from his past life, his friends from his past life, the people that Muzan had hurt, and he would avenge Shinjiro Rengoku. Before Muzan could even get out of the cocoon, Tanjiro had already sliced it clean in half. Muzan's regeneration speed was still insanely fast as he regenerated himself. He tried attacking what he thought was the weakest slayer, looking at Kanao. After all, she looked like a frail little girl. However, that was just a facade. She slashed off his arm in an instant as her eyes turned blood red, and so did Kanae's. They had both activated the ultimate technique of flower breathing. They had such a control over it that they could hold it for at least 20 minutes. All the Hashra attacked Muzan. He could not deflect or block any of these attacks as they just tore straight through his defense. Over and over and over again, hours on end. At one point, his flesh was burned. He was in a worse state than ever in his life, and he was contemplating how to escape. He was afraid. He was trembling to his core. All of his cells were on the highest alert because he could not do anything. It's at this point that daybreak was nearing. Thirty minutes left, but Muzan was still in the Infinity Castle, and as long as he stayed here, he could win. Demon Slayers could still get exhausted, stamina was still a thing, but Tanjiro was still perfectly fine. He could fight another three hours perfectly fine. He was enraged. He wasn't losing control. But he remembered, he remembered his past life, the people that had died, and he was not going to get the same mistakes that he let happen in the past. Other demon slayers like Yome and Sanami were also preparing to go full out. It's at this point that Tanjiro rushed at Muzan with the first form. He had constantly repeated the Hinokami Kagura, which Muzan could not deflect, and in an instant he slashed upwards, sending Muzan into the roof of the Infinity Castle, through the roof, and into the open world. All the Hashra 
jumped out of the hole that was created, like red ants out of a ant nest after it being destroyed, and they all started attacking Muzan once more. Ten minutes passed by, twenty minutes remaining until daytime. Ubiashiki and the rest of the Ubiashiki family, all cheering for the demon slayers to go and fight. Some of the slayers that were exhausted, cheering them on from the sideline, giving them confident boosts to the point where the fighting just got even more intense. Muzan's skin was red. It was burnt to the point where he didn't know if he could keep taking these attacks and regenerate. His old scars were way worse than what they were in the past, and he had received way more damage than he had ever received in his entire lifespan. He contemplated giving up, but he wanted to live. He always wanted to live. He thought of the past, where he got given this chance to live, and made the dumb mistake of killing the doctor before finishing the treatment, which led to his entire life goal, finding this cure so that he could be immortal. He didn't want to die, he wanted to live forever, but why? He started asking himself over and over again, why did he want to keep living? He couldn't find a real answer. Was it world domination? No, that had never got into his mind when he was dying as a human. So why? Muzan started falling into despair. But he would not give up. He didn't want to. Why had he lived thousands of years just to die now? No, he didn't accept it. He fell into a rage, summoning every bit, every ounce of power he had left to attack all the demon slayers with roars and attacks that would paralyze them. Most of the demon slayers were, only a few being able to fend off the attacks, but Tanjiro was still fine, and as long as Tanjiro was fine, there was no way he would win this fight. Muzan was nearing his end. Ten minutes remained. Tanjiro kept doing every move of sun breathing. Hinokami Kagura, the exact same thing that he had first learned, he kept doing it over and over again. Perfectly. Even better than Yoroichi. There was no opening, and when Tanjiro couldn't hit Muzan, his father did. Five minutes remained. The fight continued and continued, but now only Tanjiro was fighting. The other slayers had pushed all of their power out, and they had to take a break. Tanjiro started to get nervous. Muzan realized this and saw it as his chance. With only two minutes remaining until daybreak, sunlight already peeking through the sky. Tanjiro missed once more, and Muzan tried jumping away. However, Tanjiro learned from his mistakes. When he went away for those Six months, those four months, those, that time frame that he was gone from the Demon Slayer core, he went back to the basics. He went back to the basics, to the foundation, to his origin. Everything he had learned from the past, he perfected to a point where it was no longer human. And one of the very first things that he had learned from Sokonji Orokodaki throws hand-to-hand -hand combat. He utilized it. He slashed at Muzan one more time, hitting Muzan 
which slowed him down. But Muzan thought he'd get away, but no. Tantro had his leg. With one arm, he threw Muzan over him, slammed him down into the ground, creating a crater. Muzan coughed up blood, which was a real surprise to him. He thought his durability was fine, but then he realized it. He had no more durability. He couldn't regenerate anymore. What was happening? It's at that point he realized Tandro's blade was so hot it was blue. Tandro's blade was hotter than any blade ever. Tandro's mark was glowing and his grip was almost breaking his blade. That's how much pressure Tandro had put into his blade with only one hand. Tandro's eyes were bloodshot red. Almost like how when he first fought Daki, but worse, though he was still breathing, he entered a state where he had surpassed the limits that he had already broken again and again. If he was called a monster before, now he was a demon. He kept fighting Muzan, slashing at the Demon King who could no longer regenerate. His regeneration slowed to the point where it looked like he had not regenerated. 30 seconds remained, and Muzan gave up. He could not escape. And after 30 seconds, daybreak came. Muzan thought maybe he could pass on his will, but he did not have the strength to move his body. The drugs in his body, his non-regenerative power, the pain he felt, and the fear of death all came over him at the same time as he started disintegrating. And soon, the king of all demons, Kibutsuji Muzan, was gone. The demon slayers, exhausted and not exhausted demon slayers, cheered. They cried out. They cried. They yelled. They screamed. Kyojuro Rengoku laughed. A bigger smile than he had ever showed. Tanjiro fell on his butt and started laughing. They all cheered. They had finally done it. They had beaten Kibutsuji Muzan, and there were almost no casualties. Two months after the Demon King had perished, the remaining Demon Slayer Corps had taken care of all of the remaining demons. The last Hashra meeting was called. Ubiyashiki thanked every Demon Slayer. He cried as he was giving his speech. He said, I'm so glad this ended with me and that I didn't have to put this burden on my sons and daughters. I thank you all for your participation, your courage, and your fighting will from the bottom of my heart. He said as the demon slayers bowed giving their respects to Ubiyashiki. For the last time, they all walked through the garden of gravestones, giving their respects to the fallen slayers. Ubiyashiki accompanied them, though he was being carried. They paid their respects to their fallen comrades, their brothers in arms, and they continued on. They had a massive party at the Demon Slayer Corps before finally all setting out on their own. Kano and Kane both fell in love with Tanjiro, who took both of them as his wives. Shinobu fell in love with Giyu Tomioka, and that's about that. 
Kyojuro and his younger brother continue to live at their flame Hashra mansion, whilst Tanjiro and his family went back to their own. Tanjiro had kept his mansion, the Sun Hashra mansion, but their family still lived on the mountain that they came from. One last time, when the new year came, all the Hashra had come together at Tanjiro's home. It was cramp and small, but they all enjoyed being there. They laughed together, they smiled, they spoke stories, they were at peace. Their smiles faded to the distance, and soon a new dawn had appeared. And that marks the end of What If Tanjiro Went Back in Time, the movie. And yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. Once again, like and subscribe. Like I said in the beginning of the video, join the Discord. We'd love to have you there. And yeah, with that out of the way, I'll see you lovely cubs in the next video. My name's the Dragon Lord. And I'll be signing out.